So thank you for registering. Thank you for being here. Today is day one. We have a great set of talks all week long. Uh, we have uh, Jesus Fernandez. Uh, Fernandez I, did, I did everything you asked ask me to do. Okay, should I get going, Alexi? Or should I wait one more minute? We'll get started in just a minute. There's still people coming in. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to the MFS Virtual Summer School 2022. We have a great set of um, talks for you this week. Starting today with Jesus Fernandez Villaverde. Tomorrow we have Wengxing Du from University of Chicago. On Wednesday, we have Hanna Lusti, Stanford. Thursday, Dimitris Papanikolaou from Northwestern. And on Friday, Laura Velkamp from Columbia. Um, so these are a great set of talks. They'll be at 9 to 12 um, every morning, uh, stream live on Facebook. And um, as far as how we're going to go forward, um, if you have questions, uh, please write them in the chat. You can also use the raise hand feature. And then occasionally, we'll stop and uh, I'll direct those questions uh, to the speaker. So in today's case, to Jesus. So use the chat feature, type in your questions, or raise your hand, and then we'll get to you. We'll take occasional breaks for questions. Um, we'll also have a short break around 10.30. Um, but other than that, we'll go from, from 9 to 12. Um, so I'm very happy to uh, introduce you to Jesus, Jesus Fernandez Villaverde today from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Jesus is a, a longtime friend of the Macro Finance Society. Uh, he works on lots of topics that are near and dear to our hearts. Uh, so without further ado, um, uh, here's Jesus. He'll uh, be talking about machine learning and micro fi macro finance. Take it away, Jesus. Okay, thanks, Alexi. Thanks, everyone, to come, uh, to come this morning. So let me share my screen. And hopefully you can see the slides now. Do you? Do you want to put it in full screen mode? No, because to... I'm actually I have a Mac and Zoom and Mac do not like a full screen mode, unfortunately. Okay, go for it. Anyway, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to make this uh, over there. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so in, indeed, I want to uh, talk today about uh, machine learning for macrofinance. And uh, the very first thing I want to do is to, um, you know, define the concept that we are going to be dealing the, uh, today with and what is machine learning. So you want to think about machine learning as a wide set of <laughs> algorithms to detect and learn uh, from patterns in the data. And the data can be either observed or simulated. And once we have detected these patterns from the data, then we can use them for decision making or to forecast future realizations of random variables. And basically, the idea over here is that we are going to be focusing on the recursive processing of information to improve performance over time. In fact, if you think about this just one second, it's much clearer to see what we are going to do instead of using the English word, uh, the English name for this technique, uh, machine learning, we focus a little bit on how it's called in other languages. So for instance, in different languages like French or Spanish, the way you refer to machine learning is as automatic learning. And I actually think that automatic learning, or even in English in the 1990s, a lot of people refer to this area as statistical learning, makes the point much clearer. Basically, we are going to have a bunch of data. And what we want to do is to learn a little bit about that data in, uh, in an automatic way. And more formally, the way you can think about this is that you are going to select an appropriate function that makes sense of the data in a dense functional space. So how does this compare with traditional methods? So imagine the, uh, that we are taking a class in um, data analysis, let's say 10 or 20 years ago. So basically what you do, 
is you determine a set of rules. You are going to have some data. And given those rules and those data, you are going to get some answers. So this is what we have been doing for decades. What machine learning does is switch the rules as an input to an output. And the answers, in some sense, are part of the input. And from those answers and the data, what we try to do is to infer the rules. So let me give you a very simple example that I take from one of my co-authors, Simon Scheidegger. Imagine that you have these five cartoon characters, okay? And what you want to do is, for instance, classify them into different groups. And what you want to do is to have some type of algorithm that will learn that these three cartoons are ducks, while these other two are not. So what will be the traditional way to do these things? Well, in the traditional way to do these things, we'll design a computer algorithm that will say, well, look at an image, huh? and if you have a peak, and if you have uh, some flips on, on your feet, and if you have some um, you know, white color or, or black color, you are going to be a duck. And if you have like these big ears, you are not a duck, you are going to be something different. In comparison, in machine learning, we are not going to give the computer the definition of what a duck is. We are going to tell the computer that this is a duck and this is not a duck. And then the computer, the algorithm is going to try to figure it out what is and what is not a duck. Okay. In that sense, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is a very wide area. And within that area of artificial intelligence, machine learning is just a little bit of a small subset of that, uh, of that activity. And in particular, most of what we are going to do today is in deep learning. Deep learning is going to be a subset of machine learning and is the subset that I will say at this moment is the most popular and the subset of techniques within machine learning that has delivered the biggest contributions over the last three or four years. So if you actually start reading about uh, machine learning, one of the first things that you will realize is that many of the basic ideas of machine learning, such as how to build a basic neural network, had actually been around for decades. In fact, the very first ideas go all the way back to the 1940s. And there were a few times in the past where we were in a situation where, let me just uh, hide uh, this thing because otherwise it's going to be very difficult. And we were in a situation where there were some um, used to uh, try to do this um, machine learning and these waves of excitement were uh, followed by backlashes. However, over the last decade or so, we have had four big forces behind the revival of machine learning. One is the arrival of big data. For the first time, we have data sets that are orders, several orders of magnitude larger than anything that we had had before. <laughs> and those data sets, in addition, also have long tails. But I mean by that is we have enough observations, even in relatively uh, minor parts of the distribution, part of the distribution that have little uh, components. We have a very, very cheap computational power, which means we can implement algorithms that Again, even 10 or 20 years ago will have been unfeasible from a pure uh, computational perspective, and we have developed great algorithms. And in fact, all these four forces are more likely than not to become stronger over time. And that's what has led to an exponential growth in the industry, and in particular, the creation of the, <coughs> excuse me, of libraries in Python, in R, and in other suitable uh, languages. Okay, so the type of libraries that I'm talking about, some of you may have already heard about them, but you know, the traditional library was TensorFlow, although these days TensorFlow is a little bit on its way out. That's probably not something you want to learn. And uh, more recently, for instance, JAX has become the preferred library for Google in their development of this type of machine learning algorithms. You also have PyTorch. And if you are in a Julia environment, you have Flux. So basically what you have at this moment is a great set of very, very powerful libraries that allow you, that allows you to really do this implementation 
in much a uh, very, very convenient way. Okay. Well, all this is very good, but then the question that you want to ask is uh, how is this going to be of um, any use in the field of microfinance? Well, what I will try to convince you during the next uh, three hours today is that most problems that we are interested in in microfinance are in fact problems that are related with learning about functional forms. Okay? Uh, for instance, and this is where we are going to spend quite a bit of time today, one of them is the solution methods for economic models. So imagine that you have your favorite corporate finance model or your favorite asset pricing model or your favorite uh, model of the interactions between the financial sector and the real economy, and you want to solve those models. You want to find a computational solution to those models. And uh, basically that you are looking for is a, is a series, so it's a, it's a number of functional forms and machine learning is going to be of great help over there. And that's in fact my own work on learning. But you can also think about machine learning as a structured way to think about uh, bounded rationality. And you have, for instance, reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is a subset of machine learning when you are having um, agents that learn about the data in a systematic way. So if you are going to build a model of bounded rationality, you can think about, or you can think about your agents as following these reinforcement learning algorithms. You can use also this machine learning to do data processing, especially in situations where the data is not structured. What I mean by non-structured data is data that does not come in a nice handy uh, Excel file. So think about photographs, think about, for instance, satellite photographs, Think about, for instance, about text, uh, statements by policymakers, press conferences, um, reports by companies, uh, but you can also think about social media, and you can think really a very, very large range of data sets. So for instance, recently I have been working a lot with text data uh, from statements by the Federal Open Market Committee, and I have also worked a little bit on the use of uh, photographs, satellite photographs. And finally, because you want to have more flexible empirical models, so for instance, think about the deep instrumental variables, but hard for it all, that are more flexible and more general than the traditional uh, empirical methods that you have in econometrics. So just to you know, summarize, machine learning is about approximation, approximating functions. And any function approximation is at the very core of functional approximation, is at the core of how to solve a model, is at the core of how to think about bounded rationality, is at the core of how to think about non structured data, and is at the core of econometrics. Now, at the same time, it's important to distinguish signal from noise. There is a lot of stuff being doing these days in machine learning and economics. And yes, because it's machine learning, it doesn't ensure that it's going to be of such high quality. In fact, there is you know, quite a lot of papers that are a little bit cheap and they are not that great. Yes, because someone learns to use statistical machine, um, statist uh, some package, some machine learning package, and is able uh, to deal with it. Also, Another important warning that I want to highlight is that machine learning is a catch-all is a catch-all name for a very, very large family of methods. So in that sense, it's absolutely impossible to cover all of them in just a few hours. I'm only going to highlight the methods that I find are the most interesting. And some of them are, in fact, some of these methods are in fact some very old-fashioned methods statistics and econometrics presented under alternative names. So as you go over uh, machine learning uh, textbooks, don't be surprised if suddenly they are going to start trying, telling you what a probit is and you say, look, I have known probits for decades. Yes, well, but, you know, again, it's just a way to think about the data and they really try to encompass all these different ways. Of course, today I'm going to, try to tell you something uh, quite more general than before. Now, what is absolutely... Um, clear and I have been telling you from the beginning is that in three hours I cannot really cover anything but an extremely brief introduction to the field. So what I uh, can do is I can tell you to go to my uh, 
web page and click on teaching. So on the slides, you will see the address is uh, SAS UPenn EDU. Jesus FB is my username. And then if you click on teaching, you will see I have a bunch of courses online. And one of them uh, on uh, they, are, they are grouped by different fields. Uh, and if you click on courses on computation, what you will see is a course called machine learning for macroeconomics. That's an accordion uh, button. So click on the accordion button and you will see a set of 11 lectures that goes from like a general introduction on machine learning for macroeconomics. Uh, well, I call macroeconomics, but you know, it's really, there is no much difference with respect to what I tell you today with respect to microfinance. It's absolutely the same. And then you will have a lecture on coding machine learning algorithms that will highlight a lot the aspects of how to actually do this in practice with the computer and discussions about the libraries and environments to do it, which today I will not have much time to discuss. There will be an introduction to deep learning. There will be a long lecture in optimization learning because you will see that deep learning is really about uh, solving a minimization problem. Uh, you will see an introduction why it's difficult to solve economic models in general and why machine learning helps a lot with it. And then I will uh, have a lecture. I have a lecture on deep learning for solving economic models. There will be also a lecture on advanced topics in deep learning, lectures on symmetry and dynamic programming and transversality and institutionality with deep learning. And then I wrap up the course with reinforcement learning and machine learning for data analysis. So I will say that this is a yeah probably a semester length, a semester length uh, course. There is enough material over there to teach for maybe 14 weeks. And what I'm going to do today is in fact just pick and choose a few of the most important slides from these 11 lectures and kind of give you the very, very brief introduction of what is going on. But again, you know, keep in mind that if you go over here, you will have the whole semester. And in addition to it, there will be tons of references. OK, so over there, if you click on these slides, you will find a lot of references to other books, et cetera, and so on and so forth. OK, so before I move into a little bit more of a formal approach, um, questions about this um, a kind of general or very brief introduction? Alexi, have you collected some questions? Yeah, Jesus, we have one question from uh, Jamil. He mm -hmm. wants to know what is deep learning, if you have a definition of that or yeah. what it entails. If that's yeah. something you're going to get to later, feel free to postpone. But that yeah. Came yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to define deep learning in just three slides. And very quickly, is we are going to use neural networks. And deep over here means to the depth of the neural network. It's not about the fact that it's deep in the sense of being very philosophical or very, you know, um, sophisticated. It's just about the, the 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 length and the width and the depth of the neural network. Okay. Anything else? Very good. That's it for now. Any other questions? If anyone wants to raise their hand. Okay. If not, let's just let's keep going. Okay, very good. So without further ado, let me get into a little bit more of a formal approach. And let's try to think about this using some math. As I was saying before, at the very core of what we do in economics is we want to approximate a known function. Okay. So think about it in this way. What we are going to have is a function f of x that maps into y. And in general, in addition to it, x is going to be a vector of different variables from, you know, we are going to have a constant. A constant is always useful to capture the average of a function. And then we are going to have n possible variables. And the output is going to be a scalar. Now, that's not a big uh, problem. It could also be a vector, for instance, a probability distribution. But uh, to make the notation a little bit easier today, let me take y as being an, an scalar. And also, we want to think about the situation where n is possibly large. Okay, so and by possibly large, <coughs> excuse me, and by possibly large, I don't mean two or three variables. I mean ten thousand, twenty thousand, fifty thousand different variables. And what we want to do is we want to learn about function f. Why do we want to learn about this function f? 
because that's the type of object that we care about in economics. Think about a value function. So you are solving your favorite macro finance model, and there is going to be a value, fu a value function defined by a Bellman equation. Well, then you want to find that value function. That's your function f that depends on the state variables. Or instead of a value function, what you want to do is you want to approximate a policy function. So again, uh, decision rule of the agents. That's a function that maps the states into the decisions of the agents. Or you are looking for a pricing kernel. A pricing kernel is going to map the states of the economy into a function that is going to allow you to price any asset AT. Or you want to think about a conditional expectation. You are interested about the conditional expectation of inflation in the next period. Or you are interested about a classifier. So a classifier is just the generalization of uh, <coughs> discrete choice models. So a classifier is basically any type of function that tells you this is a duck or this is not a duck. But you can also think about it as are you going to college or are you not going to college? Are you going to purchase this uh, uh, stock or are not going to purchase this uh, stock? Okay. So how do you or how can you approximate um, an unknown function? And again, think about this unknown function coming either from an economic model or from an econometric model. Well, what a neural network proposes is to approximate the function fx as follows. We are going to have an approximation gnn for neural network that depends, of course, on the same variables x that the function we are looking for and some weights. Okay? So these thetas are going to be weights. And in particular, that approximation is going to have the form theta sub zero is just going to be the leading term, one of the weights, plus the sum between lowercase m equal to one to capital M of theta m phi of z m. This function phi is going to be call an activation function. And I will tell you later what activation functions I have in mind. And Zm is just a linear combination of the x's. Remember that we have the x's over here? It's a vector. So I'm just going to take each of the components of the vector. I'm going to multiply it by a one of these weights, and I'm going to sum them. Remember, we had and different dimensions starting at zero because we have a constant and that gives me a ZM. So let's look at what we have done so far. We basically take our input XN, which remember is just each of the components of X. We do a linear combination. This is just a linear combination. This is nothing else. And that gives us ZM. We put this ZM into this activation function and we do another linear combination because we are going to build capital M of these linear combinations, where of course the weights are different in each of the M's. So we are doing linear combination, activation function, linear combination. And this is very, very important to remember. Okay? So we are, it's, it's a linear combination, plus the activation function, plus a linear combination. Everything is linear except the activation function. Each of the Xn is in this field called the features of the data. So what do I mean by features of the data? Well, in economics, if you are thinking about the state variables, it can be the capital of the firm, the debt of the firm, the cash at hand of the firm. If you are thinking about a photograph, it can be the pixels in the photograph, but they are just some things of the day. Or if you're thinking about text analysis, the number of times the word inflation shows up in the corporate report. But at the very core, what you have are some features of the data. You are making a linear combination of these features of the data. You are taking an activation function, and then you make a linear combination 
of those representations of the data because the theta, sorry, the VM are called or are known as the representations of the data. The number of these representations, capital M, is known as the width of the model. And in general, we are going to think about M as being large. And don't worry, later on, in just half an hour or so, I'm going to tell you what is an activation function, which activation function should you use, and how do you select M, and how do you select the thetas, the weights. At this moment, I'm just trying to tell you what the representation is, okay? So we take the features of the data, whatever components the data have, we make these representations of the data with this linear combination, we pass these representations of the data in the activation function, we do M of those, we put a constant, and that gives us the approximation to our function. Okay? And what, and this is a neural network, and what does it mean to train the network? Train the network means that we are going to select the weights theta such that this approximation g of n n is as close as possible to f x, <coughs> the unknown function, given some relevant metric. For instance, using the L2 norm. And of course, we need to figure it out how we define that distance and how minimize that distance. But we will come back to that later on. Okay? Sorry, I need to clean this before. Okay. This is just a graphical representation of the same idea. And then you will see why this is sometimes called a neural network. You have the inputs, which are the features of the data. You multiply them by the weights. That gives you the linear transformation. You put it in the activation function and you get the output. And since this looks a little bit like a neuron in your brain, in your nervous system, that's why this is called a neural network. So how does this compare with other approximations? Well, Let's think about a standard projection. Okay, so in economics, we have been doing uh, approximations like Chebyshev polynomials for a decade, for not a decade, no, three decades, sorry. So let's imagine that what we want to do is to approximate a function again f using Chebyshev polynomials. And now the approximation, uh, so you see the difference is CP for Chebyshev polynomial. Again, as in the neural network, this is remember the approximation with the neural network. As in the neural network, we are going to have a constant. We always have a leading term. And we also have a sum. Over here is of M representations of the data. Over here is going to be of M Chebyshev polynomials. And we are also going to have a weight over here. So, so far, a neural network approximation and a Chebyshev polynomial approximation look very, very similar. The difference is going to be here. The difference is that in the neural network, we have an activation function, which node does not depend on M, while over here, we are going to have Chebyshev polynomial that does depend on M. You see, no M over here, but there is an M over here. And over here, what I'm going to have is a linear combination of the elements of the data. And in this linear combination, of course, it depends on the M. While over here, I just put directly the vector. So the way you want to think about this is that we are exchanging a rich parametrization of coefficients. There, is, there are a lot of coefficients in the, uh, in the in the neural network. You have all these weights over here, but then you also have all these weights inside each of the representations of the data. So you're really substituting a lot of, heck, let me do it this way so it's clear. You have a lot of coefficients over here, while over here you have much less, much fewer coefficients. But you have over here only one activation function, and over here you have all the Chebyshev polynomials. So the idea is you are substituting a rich parametrization of coefficients 
for the parsimony of basis functions. And in a few slides, I will tell you why this is a good idea. But the point here to remember or to notice is how similar a Chebyshev polynomial and a neural network are. We are not doing anything as strange or different. We are not coming up with a completely different way of thinking about the world. We are still doing a very straightforward functional approximation where we have a function to approximate that is going to depend on some weights and some basis functions, in this case, the activation function. Okay. Now, what I have just told you over here is a standard neural network. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce a neural network that has multiple layers. And this is what is known as deep learning. So as before, we are going to take the features of the data Remember the X ends, we have some weights and we find this linear combination Z of M. And we put them exactly as we did before in an activation function. But then instead of just stopping there and saying that's our output, we are going to say, we are going to do this again. And now we have these ZMs we are going to put them again in an activation function. We are going to get a new output and we are going to keep doing this for many, many layers until we get to the final layer J. Now, the number of M's, the activation functions, et cetera, are possibly different across each layer of the network. That's not that important. But again, I'm going to tell you later about how we do this in practice. But the point is, why is this called deep? As I was saying before, it's called deep because you have multiple, deep over here means multiple layers, okay? Deep over here doesn't mean profound in the sense of a you know, uh, profound philosophical investigation. It just means we have multiple layers. We take the data, or features, we find ZMs, we put them over here, we do the linear transformation, we have new ZMs, and we keep doing this for J different layers. And this is what is known as a deep learning network. And in terms of a graphical representation, again, we will have three features of the data. So imagine that this is a very simple model of corporate finance. So X0 can be constant, X1 is the capital of the firm, and X2 is the depth of the firm. And then we you know, do this Z transformation, and then we do another Z transformation, and then we have some final output, okay? So basically we take the different features of the data, the different states in this case for the model, we transform them in these different ways several times until we get an output layer. Now, the number of layers J is known as the depth of the network. And in that sense, we can have deep networks where we have many, many Js and shallow networks where we only have one J. And in fact, when J is equal to one, we just have the basic neural network that I told you before. So from now on, I'm going to refer to neural networks as including both the single and the multi-layer networks. And exactly as before, we are going to select the thetas, the weight of the neural network, <coughs> such that the approximation J of DL, where now DL means deep learning, approximates a target function Fx as close as possible under some relevant metric. Now, we can have multiple multidimensional outputs. That's very easy. Basically over here in the last, if Y is a vector instead of a scalar, in the last layer, what you will have is that these thetas and these thetas be vectors. So you will also have, you will map the representations of the data into a vector. 
And you can even produce a probability distribution. And the way you do a probability distribution is in the very last layer, instead of doing this standard linear combination, you do something called a softmax layer, where you basically, you use this type of, you're probably familiar uh, with this type of measure. micro from uh, econometrics, when you just take the ZMs and you take the exponent of ZM and divide by the sum of all the exponents of ZMs, okay? And what you are having over here is then that you have your uh, deep network and uh, you have a bunch of elements of this network. So you have the activation function, you have the number of layers, you have the number of features of uh, representations that you want to find of the data, et cetera. All these things are known as the network architecture. Okay. Jesus, is this a good time for a couple of questions? Yes, let me, let me finish the definition of a network architecture. So these things are called the network architecture. And I will discuss later how we select them. At this moment, just let's assume that we know what the optimal choices or what good choices are for that network architecture. Go ahead. Okay, so a couple of questions. Um, the second one I'll start first is, back on slide 12, what was the dimensionality of theta m? Theta m, uh, yeah. from, uh, like in the basic neural network? It says, it asks about, the question is about slide 12, but I think it's the same theta m. Okay. Okay, yes. So this uh, over here, this is going to be, theta is just a scalar. It's just that you have m of them. Okay. So it's think just, about, think about why, why is a scalar? So this is a scalar. This is a scalar. So how many coefficients we have in Chebyshev polynomials? In Chebyshev polynomials, what we will have is we will have one, the leading coefficient, plus m. So this is how many weights we need to determine with Chebyshev polynomials. However, when you are doing this thing with neural networks, you have one, the original one, plus m, plus then you are going to have n plus one. So that will be... Um, m plus m times m plus one. And that's what I meant before, but as we have way, way many more uh, dimensions to take care of, okay? Because you are going to have all these extra weights over here that you don't have over there. On the other hand, you only have one activation function while each of these is going to be a different Chebyshev polynomial. Okay. Another question was, what do you use for the activation function phi B in period? We are, we are going to come back to all that. There is a slide on activation functions, okay? Uh, a couple more. Yes. Um, one was, how do you compare data cleaning if you're going to do, um, if, if you're going to do, um, you know, with uh, deep learning or with uh, machine learning versus usual data cleaning we do when, we, when we're not doing that? Not quite sure what the question <laughs> refers to data cleaning. Um, it is to clean big data like small data. That's what the question says. I'm reinterpreting it a little bit as okay. do you, if you're going to use machine learning, is there less of a need to clean the data in the first place? That's kind of how I think about it. But there's no, no I, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, in general, machine learning is going to be a little bit more robust to me possible measurement errors. But it's still the case that, you know, um, there's the whole statement of garbage in, garbage out. If you just put very bad data into your model, you're going to get bad data, bad okay. outputs. That's in that sense, this is, this is about how to, how to interpret the existing data better, but you are not going to be able to, to, you know, achieve a miracle just because you are doing a slightly different approximation. Okay, the last question, I'm not sure I understand either. It says, how do we interpret the distribution of the softmax layer? So that's okay. Yes, this is this is very easy. So basically, uh, why is this not moving? Okay, so this is a probability distribution, and this is just the extreme distribution that we always use, like in 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 discrete choice models. So the z, you are going to achieve in these zms, and you are going to have I don't know ten of them, 
and there are like 10 possible outputs or 10 possible um, uh, outputs, yes. And you are looking at the probability. So what you want to do is to normalize them. So one ZM will be 3.2. So imagine, let's, let me just write this down and maybe a little bit easier. So you are going to have that Z sub one is, you know, we have done all this 3.21. The Z sub two, let me just do two, so it's a little bit easier to see, is 2.78. Uh, and you say, well, let's interpret this as probabilities. Well, you just say, very good. The probability of event one is just 3.21, well, the exponent. 3.21 divided by the exponent of 3.21 plus the exponent of 2.78. Okay. Let me move this so it's easy to see. Well, I hopefully you can start seeing that. And that's exactly what we do all the time in, in econometrics. In econometrics, we do all this exponent of some output of a model, like of a probit or a logic to transform it into a probability. So in that sense, that's exactly the same that we do all the time. If you're gonna, if you're gonna do one of these, uh, do you do it at the last layer? If it's yes, a... that's that's what I was saying. Is at the very last layer, so you do your, you do your same uh, stuff all the time. Uh, I don't know why today this is okay. You do this stuff. You do all the different things, and it's only in the last layer when you apply the softmax layer. So you do these things. You do all these transformations, and then you uh, you just transform the field. Okay, great. You can keep going. That's the question for now. Very good. So, okay. So we have this approximation, and I have compared it over here with Chebyshev polynomials. <laughs> and if you want to compare, and then in the deep neural network, the only thing you will need to notice is that over here, this x n will be in itself the transformation of the different ZMs. So the question is, why do neural networks work? Why do they work much better? <laughs> in fact, that uh, Chebyshev polynomials in a very, or splines or any other type of appro functional approximations in a very large class of functional approximation problems. What? Turns out to be the case that neural networks are just chains of tensor operations. What do I mean by that? We take the data, X, and what we do is we perform an affine transformation. And then we apply an activation function. Let's go back over here and let's understand what we are doing. Okay? Take the data, Xn get ZM, and then this is just an affine transformation, and then we apply the activation function, and then another affine transformation. And when you are doing this in a deep neural network, it's data, affine transformation, activation function, affine transformation, activation function, affine transformation. This is just a tensor. You remember <laughs> from your math or your physics, this is just a tensor. And by the way, now you probably understand <laughs> why the first library that really made deep learning extremely popular is called TensorFlow, because it's just about the flow of tensors. Deep net learning is just the flow of tensors. Okay? Well, what you want to think about, <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> For a second, is that tensor operations are nothing but geometric transformations of X. And now we need to use a little bit of geometry. A neural network is nothing more than a sequence of geometric transformations in a high dimensional space. And the next slide, it's a little bit easier if I were doing this in person. Um, I'm not sure if I do the stop share. And I don't know if you will be able to see me. Okay, so let's do this. You see, this is a piece of paper. And let me make a ball. Okay. And imagine 
that your problem is trying to approximate this ball in the computer. This is an extremely complex problem. Why? Because the paper ball has like a lot of ridges and imagine I should tweet that this is a very highly dimensional ball. Actually, so this thing is a little bit easier. I'm not going to take out background. This will be easier to see, okay? And now what I want to do is I want to approximate this ball of paper. This is very difficult, but what I can do is the following. Imagine that I go to the corner of my paper ball and I push it. Okay, that's just a linear transformation of a paper ball. I'm just picking a corner and pushing it. And then I'm going to apply the, the affine function. And affine function is just rotating in a particular way the piece of paper. And then I pick again another corner and I push it. And I pick the activation function and I pick another corner and I push it. And I pick another corner and I push it. And I pick another corner that I push it. And after doing this a sufficiently large number of times, what I have is a piece of paper. This is just a Euclidean space. What I have achieved is going from an extremely complex problem, which is approximating this ball of paper. And you know, if you if you had a little bit more dimension, you can you can do it yourself. Piece a piece of paper on your table and do and make a ball with it. You will realize this is extremely difficult to describe. Even if you were going to describe that to your friend, say, so, oh, you know, my, your friend is Peter. Peter, I have like this small thing over here and this small ridge over here. And imagine in addition to it that this was a dimensional, a, a ball in 10,000 dimensions. This will be an extremely complex problem to approximate. And then I just extend and rotate, extend and rotate, extend and rotate until I have a clean piece of paper. And now I can share a screen again. What I have achieved is an extremely simple Euclidean space where approximating any function in Euclidean space is a very simple problem. So why do neural networks work? And this is absolutely important that you understand. Neural networks work because the tensor operations that we apply to the data transform the functional approximation problem into a convenient functional approximation problem in the right geometric representation of the data. Instead of trying to come up with a smarter and a smarter basis functions as Chebyshev polynomials do. So what are Chebyshev polynomials or splines or finite elements or all the sorts of things that people were trying to do in functional approximation for 100 years? They were very smart people who were going to the office, they were sitting down and they were trying to come up with very, very smart functions, very smart basis functions. No, this is very simple. This is to say, no, no, no. The success of any functional approximation problem <coughs> is to search for the right geometric space in which to perform the approximation not to search for a better basis functions. And that's why neural networks work. Neural networks work because you get the right geometric space. And you get the right geometric space by doing the two functions or the two operations that you have in any geometric representation, a linear affine transformation and a rotation, which is just the activation function. Okay. Now, I just told you why neural networks work. In general, why do deep <coughs> neural networks work better than regular single layer networks? Well, first of all, I need to convince you that they do work better. And this is a very famous competition in computer science on image recognition. You don't need to worry too much about it. But, and this is basically, I give you photos and I ask you, is this a track or is this not a track? Okay, fine. So when we were using neural, shallow neural networks in 2010, 2011, the error was around 28%, 26%. That is, we give 100 photographs to the neural network and it classifies them using this softmax layer at the end. <coughs> and you will get 
a 28% error. Okay, so you will get it wrong in 28 of the, of the photographs. When we introduce different layers, for instance, eight layers in 2012, we jump from 26 to 16%, which was a huge improvement because before that, the improvements were around one or 2% a year. And by 2015, the success when you have 152 layers was 3.6%, which is actually better than human errors. So now deep neural networks can classify photographs better than humans can. And why is this the case? Why are these things working better? Well, because the number of representations, remember, the representations of the data are these fees, okay? It's the linear transformation of the data times the activation function or multiplied by the activation function. The number of representations that you have in a deep neural network grows exponentially. Just do the numbers before and you will convince yourself. While the number of hidden layers only grows linearly, which means that the computational cost also grow linearly. In other words, I can compute a deep neural network with 152 layers, like the one over here, without too much problem. And yet I'm going to have an exponentially large number of representations of the data, which is nothing more to say that I'm doing an exponentially large number of pushes and unfoldings of my sheet of paper. So I have the ability to do extremely complex geometric transformations and come up with a geometric space that is extremely convenient to approximate even the most complex functions. That means that under certain relatively weak conditions, you can prove two things. One, that neural networks are universal approximators. I can approximate any function that belongs to an extremely class of functions. I can approximate functions that have kinks. I can approximate functions that have jumps and non-continuities. All the type of constraints that I have with traditional approximation methods like need of differentiability or continuity, I don't need them. And second, neural networks break the course of dimensionality. And why do they break the course of dimensionality? Because as I was saying before, at the end, you end up with this very simple geometry that is equivalent to a very simple Euclidean geometry. And then you can approximate anything you want in an Euclidean geometry. It's just straightforward. It's to a very basic level, it's high school algebra. In fact, you can approximate models with thousands of state variables. And I'm not kidding, this is not a theoretical result. I have solved already myself a model with 10,000 state variables. Okay? And in fact, the constraint right now is not that the computation cannot handle the number of state variables, is that literally I run out of memory in the computer to have so many state variables. And again, the key is neural networks are not magic. There is nothing special about it. Neural networks, the reason they work is because you have the right geometric representation of the data. Everything is to think about the world in the, in the right geometry, which I know geometry is not really one of the main things we do in economics usually. We are more kind of um, real analysis people, but geometry is absolutely fundamental to understand any type of functional approximation problem. Moreover, beyond this type of mathematical properties, Neural networks are extremely easy to code. And why they are extremely easy to code? Because you are not going to code them yourself. Let me go back. You are going to use one of the standard libraries. These libraries are absolutely state of the art. They are fantastic libraries. And you are not going to be able to do anything better on your own. And they are uh, uh, coded by the top software engineers of our generation. They are extremely efficient and they are extremely elegant, okay? If I, at this moment, many times I get questions, which one should I use? 
my recommendation is to start with PyTorch. My recommendation is don't use TensorFlow. TensorFlow is on its way out. It's so 2019. And if you are, you know, brave, use JAX. JAX is quite amazing, but it forces you to learn functional programming, which I don't know how many of you know. Flux. It's, it's okay, it's for Julia. I just put it over there because I love Julia, but probably what you want to do is with PyTorch at this moment, okay? And this means that instead of having to code from the very beginning, you are going to have most of your work is going to be done already for you by these uh, fantastic libraries. It's going to be also very stable code and it's going to be scalable for multiprocessing. Because neural networks are built around tensors, it means that they are perfect for parallelization. And you know, sometimes I talk a lot about parallelization and about all the great things about parallelization, but neural networks dovetail with parallelization in a fantastic way. And there are so many people working on this area that the ecosystem, and by ecosystem, here I mean like the whole set of people working on these ideas is so rich that I think it really ensures the long run success. Okay, let me stop here and ask questions and uh, ask for questions. We have a couple of questions. Let's see. Um, Jing Yan, do you want to ask your question live on the air? Feel free to unmute and ask it. If not, I'll read it for you. Okay, the question was, how can you feed a deep neural network with so many parameters with relatively small set of economic data? Yeah, so we are going to go, we are going to go to that. That's going to be part of the of the of the discussion later on. Of course, neural networks are not going to be the solution for everything. Uh, and there are going to be some situations where you don't you are not going to have enough data. So two answers. One is uh, a lot of times, and that's what I'm going to spend uh, a lot of the rest of this lecture today, data is not observed, data is simulated. And the good thing about simulated data is you can have as much as you need. And in particular, I'm going to show you how you can use these neural networks to solve economic models. And to solve economic models, you, the only thing you need to do is to simulate the model as many times as you need. With respect to the data from the real world, First of all, yes, there are going to be a few situations where this is not going to be feasible, but there is also a lot of effort these days in techniques called data augmentation that basically what they try to do is they try to think about how to leverage as much as possible the data that we have out there. But yes, there are going to be some situations where just using a neural network is not going to be feasible because you don't have enough observations. Okay, another question from Zohair is, whether we can think of the layers of neural networks as doing principal component analysis sequentially. So taking yeah. principal components of principal components to reduce dimensionality of the data. Is there a connection between PC analysis and neural networks? There is, yeah, there is some interpretation. I would say there is a loose connection or maybe more on, on kind of similar intuition, maybe a better way to say it. <laughs> And it's, the, the ideas is very similar, but I, I think it's maybe a little bit clearer if you focus in what I was saying before in uh, geometric transformations of the data. And that's really the way I like to think about it. And as I think the, the way the top researchers in this field think I like to think about it. So the next question is repeated. It's asking whether the intermediate layers are only transforming the geometry and the last layer the actual approximation. Yes, exactly. So that's the way to think about it. So basically what you are doing over here, even in the first layer, so when you are doing, let's do it is with a very, very simple representation with a one layer. So you are basically taking over here the Xn, okay? And you are making a first affine transformation and then with the fees, you are doing a rotation. So you have already a different, a different geometry and then you do just a linear combination in the appropriate geometry of the data. And what you are doing this when you have different layers is just doing this sequentially. So as I was saying before, what you want to do is always do something, doing an approximation in an Euclidean space. That's the only way you are going to be able to approximate things in very high dimensions if you are dealing with a Euclidean space. So what you do is you take the data, you transform it first with an affine transformation and then with the activation function. And whatever you have left, you think, well, that's my Euclidean space. 
and I'm going to do just linear combinations in that Euclidean space. Okay, when you are doing this in a deep way, you are doing it in several different uh, layers in a sequential way. Okay, last question for now. What's the advantage of neural network over lasso, principal component analysis, decision tree? Okay. So these are different tools for different problems. Uh, so what you are doing in lasso is you are working, for instance, on some type of linear representation of the data. And what you want to do is to penalize the number of regressors that you have. With a neural network, you are dealing with a general nonlinear representation of the data. So in principle, if you have more data, the neural network is going to be able to capture all the nonlinearities in the data. Now, the problem that you may encounter is that you don't have enough data to do it. But in principle, with enough data, neural networks are going to be able to beat everyone else. And that's why, in fact, things like random forest or support vector machines are really going out of fashion. If you go to the computer science department, people don't really use them anymore. And because they realize that neural networks work much better. Now, going back to one of the questions before, the neural network requires quite a bit of observations. So it may not be feasible to implement it with real data, but conditional on having enough data, a deep neural network is certainly a superior alternative to anything around. Okay. Okay, we had a couple of follow ups actually. So Arthur yeah. was asking, they're all kind of related. Um, would you ever prefer something like Chebyshev approximation over a neural network? Yeah, if you are if you are working with a very simple one-dimensional problem, a Chebyshev approximation is going to be very fast and easy to, to implement. So that's going to be probably a, 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 a simpler thing to do. But as soon, the problem with Chebyshev approximations is as soon as you go to two or three dimensions, is just that you saturate them and you cannot solve Chebyshev approximations very well. I have papers where I have tried to solve Chebyshev approximations in five dimensions and it was a nightmare. Right. I will have some slides about that later on. But yeah, if you are going to solve problems that are very simple in one or two dimensions, Chebyshev may be much easier and faster to run that neural network. But as soon as you go to high dimensions, remember the whole motivation a few slides back is that we are dealing where n is large. So you really want to think about this as n large. You, we are not having this. We are not having this lecture today for n equal to one, n equal to two. We are really dealing for n equal to ten thousand. And um, this was kind of interesting. Um, do you need to first transform your data into stationary data by first differences? Um, mm -hmm. Uh, before you feed it into the neural network? Uh, in general, no. And in fact, I'm. <laughs> this is a more general point. I think that Chris Sims and Mark Watson and Jim Stock taught us in the early 1990s that in general, first differencing is a bad idea. Um, and I never first differentiate anything in my life. Um, I think that um, um, Non-stationarity is an issue to compute standard errors. It's not an issue for point estimation. And this is exactly the same thing. Okay, that's clear enough. Let's okay. keep going. Okay, very good. Okay, so as I was mentioning before, the, what you really want to keep in mind is that um, neural networks are universal approximators and they break the course of dimensionality. And I'm going to uh, keep that uh, in mind because we are going to come back to that point later on. Okay, and why is this useful? Well, this is useful because this is the type of problems that we encounter in macrofinance. So many interesting questions in macrofinance require solving models with many, many state variables. So for instance, um, you want to solve models of corporate finance. And what you're going to have is a lot of state variables. You have capital and equipment and debt and cash and long-term debt and short-term debt. You want to think about models where you have rich life cycle because you, know, you have many different assets over the life cycle, et cetera. So those are models with many, many state variables. It's trivial to build models with 10, 20, 30 state variables. We also want to have models where there are non-linearities. And you can think about non-linearities as having local features and irregularly shaped domains. 
So for instance, how do financial crises arise or why do countries and firms default? Why do firms invest in large lumpy projects? And all of those are about non-linearities. And then of course, we are dealing with models in macrofinance time with heterogeneous agents. And I want to think about heterogeneous agents as models with very large amounts of data. And examples include, so for instance, models that we build to think about the relations between asset prices and the wealth inequality, or how does inequality affect monetary and fiscal policy. Okay? And in fact, if you think about it, all these three elements come together more often than not. So for instance, think about the examples of heterogeneous agent models with binding constraints, with nominal frictions, and with many assets. Well, so we want to solve these models. It's at the very core of what we want to do in macrofinance. We want to solve models with many state variables. We want to solve models with non-linearities, and we want to solve models with heterogeneous agents. So what is the problem? What do we have on the table? Well, imagine that we want to solve these models using polynomials. So think about, by polynomials over here, I mean things like perturbations, okay? And I have written many papers using higher order perturbations. So perturbations can handle the case of many state variables. You can perfectly solve a model with 200 state variables using a third order perturbation, but you cannot solve for local features. Perturbations are local approximations, which means that when you are not doing this around the point of the perturbation, you don't do things very well. So polynomials are not really a good way to solve for models. For instance, as we were saying before, where we have all these nonlinearities. Okay, what about the splines? Yes, splines can solve for local features accurately, but the splines do not work as soon as you have a state spaces that are very regular. So let's think about a state space like this one, where for whatever the reason you cannot be here, perhaps because of some type of borrowing constraint, the splines are going to have a very, very difficult time handling this type of uh, irregular shape. Uh, domains, but more importantly, splines get saturated. As soon as you get to four or five, maybe six state dimensions, splines are out. What happens if you try to do Chebyshev polynomials, but instead of using standard Chebyshev polynomials, you, do, you use some type of sparse grids? Because I already told you, Chebyshev polynomials never go more than three or four dimensions. But you say, well, let me use a small yak uh, grid or some type of adaptive sparse grids. Yes, you are going to be able to handle many variables, but as soon as the shape domain is a little bit irregular, they don't work anymore. You can use something called Gaussian processes, and there the problem <laughs> will be that as soon as you have large amounts of data, you are trying to deal with models with heterogeneous agents, you are not going to be able to solve them. So the only method that can deal with many state variables, that can deal with local features accurately, with irregular shape domains, and with large amounts of data is deep learning. Okay? And that's why. I think that in the field of macrofinance in particular, deep learning is such a fantastic approach to the things. Now, that doesn't imply, and this goes back to one of the questions before, that deep learning is the solution to absolutely everything. There is no such a thing as a silver bullet. There are clear and serious trade-offs in real life applications. Now, and the simplest of those three off is that we are going to do tons of observations. Now, for the type of things I'm going to tell you for the rest of today, that's not a big problem. Why? Because the observations are going to be endogenous. I'm going to try to solve models. This is about how to solve models. So I can always simulate my model. I can have as many observations as I want. But there are going to be a few cases where, for instance, your goal it's trying to forecast GDP next quarter, where you're really not going to have much. You are going to have, what, 200 observations for GDP in the last quarters? And that's the situation where 
it's very unlikely that a deep neural network will beat a very simple ARIMA, at least if the only thing you are using are macro variables. Okay? So yes, neural networks are a fantastic way to approximate a lot of problems, but they are not the solution to absolutely everything. And they are not solution to absolutely everything because you will need the right number of observations. Now, for me today, it's not going to be an issue because I'm going to be using neural networks to solve models. And when I solve models, I can have as many observations as I want. But if you are going to use neural networks to estimate empirical models, that's something you may want to keep in mind. You need to have enough observations. And how many observations you will need? Well, it will depend on the particular features of your neural network and the particular architecture of your network. Okay, questions? Yeah, we have a question. Thomas, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question live on the air? Sure. Hi, thank you very much for the lecture. Um, I have a question about uh, how to use deep learning for um, initial conditions. So think of uh, value function iteration where you initialize the first value function or like the initial consumption in a shooting algorithm for yeah. a neoclassical model. Typically, the models are super sensitive uh, to the initial condition. If you put a initial condition that's a little I, bit too far from the solution, it goes further. I have, I have some slides about that later on. Why don't you let me ah, wait? Back to that. Okay, I'm Thank just you. to give like a, a general overview at this moment, of course. Okay, that's it for now. It's just okay. Very good. Okay, so let me get now into a little bit more details. <laughs> oh, and. Already before, uh, someone asked about activation functions. What activation functions can we use? And traditionally, well, the classical activation functions included the identity function. It's just the phi of z is just equal to z. And if you think about it, in that case, when z, sorry, phi is just the, um, the identity function, what you get back is that the neural network is just the linear regression. So in that way, you can think about linear regression as a very, very straightforward example of a neural network. And since I will tell you later on that the criterion that we are going to use to train the network can incorporate regularization components, you will actually see, coming back again to one of the questions I got before, that LASSO is just a very particular example of a neural network. Okay, So you can think about LASSO or even linear regression as just a very concrete and a very simple neural network. You can also use a sigmoidal function that has a very nice and simple S structure like this one. Now, those were the classical activation functions, but those are not really the activation functions that are the most popular today. The most popular today are the rectified linear unit or RELU for short, which is just the max of zero and z, okay? Nothing can be simpler than that. There is kind of a couple of approximations to it. One of them is the continuously differentiable exponential linear unit, which is this one, which basically tries to make this differentiable. Of course, as you will see in a second, relus have a kink at zero, and the soft plus, which is this one. Okay. Sorry, I should not. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. Okay. And this is just a representation of the relu, and this is a representation of the soft plus. And the question you are going to probably ask yourself is how is going to be the case that with this very, very simple relu, I can approximate anything that I want. Well, remember that in the ReLU, I'm not really putting the X, I'm really putting the X with a linear transformation. And in front of the ReLU, I'm going to have another weight. 
So this is the basic ReLU, zero and then grows. But what has happened if I have a weight one over here? I'm doing this just in one dimension because doing it in high dimensions will be very difficult, but you know, you will get the point. Move this up so you can see it. Well, if I put a one over there, I'm just moving in that direction. So now I start kicking it at minus one. And what happens if I put a minus one, I'm moving in that direction. And what happens when I multiply by 0.5, that the slope becomes smaller. And what happens when I multiply by 1.5, that the slope gets larger. And if I multiply by a minus X, I'm flipping it. If I multiply by a minus in front of the ReLU, I'm flipping it down. And if I multiply in front and inside, I'm flipping it twice over here. Okay? So basically I have all the flexibility I want to move the ReLU to the left, to the right, make it flatter or steeper, or move it in one direction, the other direction, or the direction over there. Okay? Well, and what is the great thing about ReLU? You will see in a second that we are going to be very interested in taking derivatives. We are going to train the network, which is going to be a minimization problem. We are going to try to get this approximation to be as close as possible to the function we are looking for. And that sounds a lot like a minimization problem. So I want to take derivatives. What is the great thing about the ReLU? That the derivative is trivial. The derivative is either zero or one, which means that when I need to take derivatives to do the minimization, those derivatives are going to take one. Okay, very good. So I told you before about the universal approximation and breaking the course of the missionality theorems. So the first theorem is the universal approximation result by Hornif, Steenf, and White. And it says a neural network with at least one hidden layer, that means with at least one layer as the ones I showed you before, can approximate any Borel measurable function mapping finite dimensional spaces to any desired degree of accuracy. I'm only imposing Borel measurability. I'm not imposing continuity. I'm not imposing differentiability. And the intuition of the result is very straightforward. So let's imagine that I want to approximate this function. I want to approximate x to the cube plus x squared minus x minus one. And I want to approximate it between minus two and one and a half. And I pick this function because it's nice. It's kind of as has a local max over here, and then it decreases with a local mean, and then it has a global max and a global mean that are at the corner. So even this function is relatively complex to approximate. Well, what happens when I'm trying to approximate it with only one ReLU? And again, these numbers over here are the results of optimization. So <laughs> <clears throat> and taking them as given. When I approximate the function with only one ReLU, what you will get is that you have this and this. You are basically trying to minimize the distance between the red function and the blue function. And you don't do such a great job. Well, you are only using one ReLU. But what happens when I use two ReLUs? And now the way to think about this is that the approximation is this one plus this one. Now you have the first ReLU as before, but now you have this other ReLU over here. You start doing a little bit better. What happens when I add a third ReLU? Well, the third ReLU is this thing. Now I do very well over here. What happens when I approximate with a fourth one? I get that shape. With a fifth one, I get that. And with a sixth one, you can see I do a fantastic job. And basically the intuition of the result is that I can do this for any function that I want. Even if I have jumps or I have non-differentiabilities. So if I had a jump over here, if the function will be jumping like here, there will be a ReLU like this, a ReLU like that. And then I will start putting my ReLUs over here. And I can basically 
approximate anything that I want. Okay, so with something as simple as this very basic ReLU, just by playing with where I put the ReLU, I can approximate anything that I want. Well, the geometric interpretation is that every time I do one of those ReLUs, I'm moving from this function, the problem of approximating this function, as I was saying before, into the problem of approximating this function in a much more convenient geometric space. And that's why I can do this. How does this compare with other results in series approximations? Well, with splines or with Chebyshev, I can also approximate functions, but I usually need requirements such as differentiability or at least continuity. I don't need any of those over here. So I'm much more powerful. I can do this in a much more powerful way. What is the second remarkable result? The second remarkable result is breaking the course of dimensionality. And this is originally by Barron, although there has been more recent and more powerful theorems, that basically says that a neural network is going to get an integrated square errors of order Bico. Remember, this is the Landau notation, one over M, where M is the number of nodes. So the error does not depend on the number of dimensions. The error will only depend on the number of nodes. In comparison, for any type of series approximation, the integrated square error is a further big O, one over M squared divided by N, where N is the dimensions of the functions to be approximated. So what is happening? When you are doing a Chebyshev polynomial approximation or you are doing splines, N shows up over here. 2 divided by n is going to be a small number. And because it's in the exponent of a denominator, it basically means that your approximation is going to be very poor. And that's the course of dimensionality. The course of dimensionality is when you go to high dimensions, using Chebyshev polynomials is a non-starter. It's just not going to work. While neural networks can do it. And again, the whole problem about this, or the whole key, is that Chebyshev polynomials are not looking for the right functional space. Chebyshev polynomials are looking for a smart basis function, while neural networks are looking for the right geometry of the approximation problem. And that's why deep neural networks break the course of dimensionality, but Chebyshev polynomials or splines do not. Questions about these two results? Yeah, we have a couple of questions. Um, one was a little bit from before. If mm -hmm. you don't have enough time series observations, can you make the, up for that with the larger cross section? If you don't have enough time series for a neural network. Yes, yes. no, you could do that. And that's why I was saying over here, at least only with micro variables. Okay? So think about, <clears throat> I don't want to think about this in terms of, um, time versus the cross-section. I just want to think about this in terms of the total number of observations. So you can either have a lot of cross-sectional, but a little time dimension or the other way around. But at the end of the day, you need to have enough observations. Yes. OK, and the other one is just clarifying about notation. So if you go to slide 31, um, would the depth of the network J be? No, this is actually a one layer network. This is a one layer network. So With the, six. It's just six. So six over here, this one is M. Yeah. Huh? And M is six. Okay. M is six and J is one. That sounds right. Okay. So this is this is just to show you how even a very, very simple neural network can approximate a relatively complex function. And uh, last question if we use these values, do we extrapolate linearly? I presume that means extrapolating outside of this window. I'm not sure. Yeah, no, no, you don't extrapolate linearly. That the the this approximation. Remember, you have this approximation. This approximation holds for any any place. So for any possible x, even outside your your domain, you still have the thetas and you still have the the activation function. In fact. One of the great advantages of neural networks is that they tend to extrapolate in a very natural, smooth way 
while Chebyshev polynomials tend to extrapolate in a very crazy wild way. That's actually something I'm going to go back later today if I have the time. Okay, but no, you don't extrapolate linearly. You extrapolate using the function approximation you have come up with. Okay, that's it for now. Okay, very good, excellent. Well, so let's see. Okay, so training. We need now to think about uh, training the network. And what does training means? Well, remember, it's just selecting the weights because everything we have done so far is about uh, taking these weights as given. So something you need to do is you need to specify a loss function. And the natural loss function that most people uh, pick is a quadratic loss function. Let me directly jump over here where the thetas is the argument that minimizes the square distance between, you remember G is the approximation, the like, you know, the theta zero plus the epsilon, the sum two, 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 minus the observation. And this observation can be either from the real world or it can be from simulations, okay? So that's basically what you do. You basically take the square between what your neural network is predicting, what you have observed, and you find the thetas that minimize that distance. And that's called training the network. Now, this will be an optimization problem. You need to think about some way to initialize that problem. And usually people recommend that the initial thetas come from some type of normal distribution with zero mean and some sigma that will depend, for instance, on this uh, square root over here. Okay, but you know, it's two, four times the square root of two divided by, oh, there's a small type over there, the number of inputs plus the number of outputs, but other options are possible. And also the other thing that uh, you can do is you can add regularization terms. So to here, you can add an extra term. <laughs> and if you add this term, what you get is a lasso type of approximation, okay? So lasso is nothing more than a neural network where the activation function is the identity function and you have add an L1 regularization. You can have also an L2 type of regularization term and that will give you a rich regression or you can have a combination of the bo of both of them and that will give you what is known as an elastic net. My personal experience is that in most cases, this is not really necessary and that just minimizing the square of the errors is usually more than enough. Because in neural networks, most of the ideas are about uh, basically how you do this quickly and very efficiently and you don't worry too much about getting absolutely right. It's much more important to be able to do it many, many times. And as you can imagine, as you are going to take some, um, uh, you are going to try to solve this minimization problem, you will need to take some derivatives. And that's where you are going to apply something called back propagation. <laughs> and back propagation is just realizing that the gradient of the error function has this very simple structure. And that structure will depend on the derivatives of the activation function. And that's why ReLUS became so popular. Why? Because basically what you are going to get is that you are going to have that derivative over here. This, most of the terms, remember there is many more of this theta and M, that theta M and theta zero. Most of these are going to depend on this derivative and this derivative is either one or zero, which means that computing these gradients are going, is going to be straightforward. And that's why Relus became the default and why people really, really like to solve these problems because solving from the gradient is extremely easy. Okay. Questions about this? Any questions? I don't see any right now in the chat. Okay, so why don't we, uh, since we announced we were going to have a break of like maybe 10 minutes. And when we come back, I want to tell you about architecture design which I think already came in some of the questions before, and we are going to talk 
also a little bit about a few ideas, and then we are going to try to apply this directly to models. So I'm going to have several examples of economic models and how to solve economic models using all these ideas. Okay? Okay, great. Let's take a 10-minute break, and we'll be back at 10.40. Alexei, can... yeah, yes. Is there a way I will not hear? Like I will click like all these people are getting into the wait room. Oh, you're hearing that? Oh, yeah, it's actually really distracting. Let me see if I can. I didn't. I wouldn't have thought you were hearing that. Let me see. I'll play around with it during the break. Okay, thank you.
Should we get started again? Yes. Okay, welcome back everyone. We'll get started again. Jesus, go for it. Okay, thank you. Very good. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we finished with a brief discussion of um, how we actually um, select the, the thetas and a few questions that came out before were already <laughs> about the architecture design. Okay, so what is yeah. that? That Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. I just noticed there are a couple of questions in the chat that came during the break. So would this be a good time? Yep. One was, why do we want to break the symmetry? It's, it's a phrase you had when you were talking about choosing the initial parameters. Oh, by breaking the symmetry, what I mean is you don't want all the coefficients to be the same. <clears throat> all the weights. And the reason for that is just because you are going to start searching in a very highly dimensional problem. And you just want to start from a point that is a little bit, not like zero, zero, zero. You want to have like some different slopes, nothing nothing deeper than that. Okay. Um, Christopher had two questions. Christopher, do you want to jump in and ask live if you're there? Sure, yeah. Um, so the first one was, so I saw where we discussed the theorem on the existence of, um, you know, using neural networks as functional approximators. I was just wondering whether or not we have similar theorems for also the convergence rates of neural networks as approximators. Yes, we have we have a bunch of theorems. I didn't include them over here, but in general, the theorems will tell you will give you bounds that sometimes are not that easy to interpret. Um, the interesting thing is that those those convergence rates tend to be faster with deep neural networks. So that's the main point about those. So, those so they, they tend to be faster than, for example, with the you know linear sieves or something like that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, the, the second question, if I if I may just continue, was um, are there any ways to you know make these kind of functional approximators time varying? And what I have in mind is something that will combine it with, for example, the methods used in Kalman filters or particle filters. Yes. So if you go back over here, I explain all that in lecture seven, advanced topics in deep learning. I over there, I have um, a section that I call uh, alternative architectures and I have exactly that. Great, thank you so much. Today, I'm just giving you like the very basic architecture. I'm not giving you like a very sophisticated architecture. Thank you. Okay, one more question. Ben Haz, ben Haz do you want to ask your question? Uh, hi, thank you for your presentation. Can you hear me? Sure. Uh, okay, I have a, on a slide back propagation. I didn't understand uh, why you explained this uh, uh, expression. Which Is one? Is it used uh, back propagation of the yes. last slide before going? Yes. Um, is it used for derivation of activation function or we use it after we train them? Yes, and I'm going to show you how we are going to train. So mm -hmm. how we are going to solve this, okay? And this is going to involve, this optimization problem is going to involve gradients. You will see it in a second, okay? And what I was just trying to point out is that those gradients are going to be very, very easy to, to evaluate. I'll come back to that in just five minutes. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, that's it for questions. Okay, very good. So architecture design. Anyway, so <clears throat> and before we have taken a bunch of things as given, okay? And this, this bunch of things as given sometimes are called hyperparameters. So one of them was the activation function. And I already told you about the relus. Uh, how many neurons you pick, uh, how many layers you pick, how long you simulate, et cetera. All these things are usually grouped in something called architecture and people use the vault A to denote it. So how do you do this? How do you select the architecture in real life? Well, this is not very different. That imagine that you are trying to do a vector autoregression and you say, well, let me try three lags. Do I fit the data well or not? Well, you try with three and then you try with two or you try with four and you kind of fine tune it until a little bit you get the right way to do it. And you can do it a little bit more formally. So for instance, you can use something called cross-validation where you will take the full data. You may, for instance, divide it in five blocks 
and you will train the neural network only with 80% of the data and you will test how well the neural network forecast the other 20% of the data that you have not used to train it. And you will move the blocks sequentially. So you will actually train five different neural networks. You will test them in each of the 20% of the data you are reserving that changes over time. And then you basically play with the different elements of the activation function, number of neurons, number of layers, et cetera, okay? And that's how people do this in life. You basically play with the data and try to see it a little bit. Now, the very good thing is that if you are using the right libraries, all this training is very easy because the only thing you need to do is you go to the code and where it says j equal to three, you put j equal to four and you click the button again. So it's actually not very different or very difficult. But the fantastic thing is that our dear, dear friends at Google have a fantastic web page where you can actually see this in practice. So imagine that I have the following data. The data is over here. I hopefully you can see it. Okay. So the data comes in two dimensions, X and Y. So the way you can think about it is imagine that this is age and this is income. And we are trying to figure it out. What we are trying to have is a model to understand <coughs> if people imagine orange means you invest in the stock market, And blue means you do not invest in the youth market, no stock market, okay? And the data just happens to be that, you know, people in their middle age and with regular income don't invest in the stock market and people who happen to be either very young or very old or have higher income or low income invest in the stock market, whatever. Or it can be uh, you go to vacation to the mountain or to the sea. It's just some data, okay? And what we want to do is we want to uh, train a neural network to account for this. So how are we going to do this? Well, very easy. First of all, in this web page, you are going to be able to select which features of the data you want to pick. So for instance, over here, let me take it out. Over here, we are going to pick just H as a feature of the data. Okay? And we are going to have just one neuron, that is M is equal to one. And the activation function, we are going to pick, you see, you can pick a ReLU, hyperbolic tangent, sigmoid, linear. So let's pick a ReLU. And then you click over there on play. And we are going to train. And let me do this. And basically what you are going to get is that when we have only one feature of the data and only one, uh, one neuron, what you get is that our neural network is going to forecast that if you are here in this combination of age or in this range of income, you are going to pick orange. And if you are in this range of age and this range of income, you are going to pick blue. Well, you are not doing that well. These are a bunch of oranges that you are missing. And here are a few blues that you are missing. Now, you can see why the neural network is trying to get this in orange because basically all of these are orange. There are very, very few blue. So you're trying to get as many of the observations right. But you are still not doing very well. It's not surprising. You are only using one feature of the data and uh, you are using only one neuron. Let's imagine that we have a second feature of the data. Okay. Ah. And one neuron. And now we train again. Now you can see that we start getting something different, but still with one neuron, you know, we get all these blue rights, but we still get all, all these oranges right. So obviously one neuron is not enough. Let's add another neuron and let's optimize this thing. We start doing much better. By the way, you start seeing the geometric structure because basically all these things are orange, all these things are blue. 
Okay, we are still partitioning the geometry of this space much better, but it's still not enough. Let's add a third neuron and let's train it. Ah, look at this. Already with three neurons, we get absolutely all the observations right. We just completed the training of our network. We started with one neuron was not enough, two neurons was not enough, but by the time we have three neurons, we actually have the geometric representation of the data where we actually get every single observation right. Now, the data that we use was very easy. Remember, this was just kind of this spiral and this spiral. I'm going to show you a different data set. This different data set is much more complicated. Why is this much more complicated? Because now things come in a spiral. These are very funny people that decide whether or not to invest on the stock market based on this very crazy combination. Imagine how difficult it is to approximate this data or to have a good accounting of this data using lasso or using a linear regression. Well, let's see what happens when we have one neuron. Yep. Of course, we don't do very well. But what happens if we have two neurons? Yep, we still don't do that great. Let's add another layer. Now we have two layers. We are still not doing that great. So let me go directly and have four layers and have a bunch of neurons in each layer. You can see how the neural network starts training, it's trying to minimize, it's trying to minimize. And you can see how it starts getting a lot of things right, it's still not quite all of them. We can stop over there. And you know, this is the predictions in blue, the predictions in orange has already kind of get a lot of them, but we probably still need more. I think I cannot get, yes, I can get five hidden layers. And let's see now. Okay. And I think I can stop it over there already. Look, we got Every so basically, what the neural network is saying if you are in this blue, if you are in this blue region, you are going to pick blue, and guess what? It gets every single observation right. And if you are in the orange region, you get every single observation right. And this is how you train a network. Look, we have approximated this extremely complicated data. Okay. And we have just have he, five hidden layers, eight neurons. We need a lot. So that's the way you do these things. Of course, this is a very nice and simple web page, and you can do it on your own. <coughs> what you are doing with real world data is a little bit more complicated in the sense that you need to, you know, make these graphs or some other measure of what is going on. But at the end of the day, what you do is you play with how many, and by the way, all this was with relus and hidden layers. If I just had things, for instance, like I could also use the squares of the observations, the training will be actually much faster and even better. Okay, look, over there, we also get absolutely everything right. Okay, so this is what you are going to be doing in practice. Let me go back to the slides. You are going to play using with the right libraries you are going to basically play with the number of neurons and the number of layers. Activation function always use a real one unless you have a very good reason. But basically you play with the number of neurons and the number of layers until you get this error to be sufficiently small. And now I'm going to tell you something that is maybe a little bit counterintuitive, but that is very different from a standard econometrics which is, it's better to, to err on the side of having too many M's or too many J's. So when you are doing this thing in econometrics, you are always told, oh, 
don't over parameterize your model. You don't want to have too many parameters. Here, that's not really the case. And the reason is because there is something called the double descent phenomenon. And the double descent phenomenon basically says that when you have a very, very <laughs> richly parameterized neural network, you are going to encounter the following. So this is the test training error. And like in a standard econometrics statistics, as you make your model more complicated, you decrease the error and then it starts going up, okay? So this is with, for instance, with vias. I have taught vector autoregressions for 20 years. And you say, well, I have one lag, two lags, three lags, four lags, but then things start going up and you start doing worse. And that's why you pick four lags for your vector autoregression. Well, it happens to be the case that when you are training neural networks, that's going to be the same. You start doing a little bit worse when you have more coefficients, more layers, but after a while, you actually stop and you start going down again. And that's why this is called the double descent phenomenon. You actually do better when you over-parameterize the model and when you over-parameterize it in a radical way. And there are some mathematical results that explain why this is the case, but I don't have a lot of time today, so let me skip them. But don't be afraid of over-parameterizing your neural network because you are going to take advantage of the double descent phenomenon. Now, of course, there is a problem of computational time. If you have a very richly parameterized neural network, it's going to be costly for you to train it, but over-parameterization is, statistically speaking, not a problem. And that's how you are going to be thinking about training your network. Questions? Any questions right now? Okay, here we go. Arthur asks, how do you pick between competing models? Hmm? What do you mean by competing models? I'm not quite sure I understand that Arthur, question. Do you wanna, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask the question? Um, yeah, can you hear me well? Yeah. Sure. Oh, great. Um, so in the previous um, examples that you've shown us on the website, it looked to me as if there were many ways to draw um, barriers, if you would use a pen, which would uh, give you the same result in terms of yeah. like characterize everything correctly. Yes. Um, yeah, so how do you choose between like different models? Since I, I don't know what the correct terminology okay. would be. Yes, in case. okay, no, what, what, what you mean is that you don't have full identification. But mm -hmm. you mean that there are going to be diff there are going to be multiple combinations of weights that account for the data equally well. Exactly. Okay. It doesn't matter. <laughs> mm -hmm. It doesn't matter because you are accounting for the data is, is equally well. And again, this is I this is one of those things that uh, you need to wrap your head a little bit around it because this deep learning thinks about the world in a very different way than standard econometrics. What these guys will tell you is you're approximating a function and there are 20 different ways to approximate the same function. If all 20 of them give you the same answer, what do you care? Well, because as a human, if you look at those pictures, you would look yeah. for some, some symmetry or something um, or like do it like 50-50 in between like draw the, the things a bit more sharper rather than, than yeah, but arbitrary. Why, no, but that's, that's just, why do you care? I mean, you are explaining, okay. that, remember the, the function is exactly the same. When you actually, if instead of doing geometrically, you do it with paper and pencil, the numerical evaluation is the same. Mm -hmm. So you are, not making any, you are not making any mistake. All those different functions or models, or the weights, let me put it in this way. All those weights are the why, the, fun, the, the output is the same. So mm -hmm. you care, okay? Yes, and that's yes. one, one of the interesting things. In very highly dimensional spaces, there are many ways to express the same function, but they are all absolutely equivalent. And there is no mm -hmm. particular reason to pick one or the other. They are all the same. And that's one of the great things about this. You don't need to... Remember, the weights do not have a structural interpretation. This is not like in econometrics, where we are trying to evaluate. The weight is not the discount factor or the risk aversion. What is going to happen is that all these weights are going to map into one particular risk aversion, but it doesn't matter. 
because all the weights map into the same discount factor. Mm. Okay, it's just that there are many, many ways that the discount factor you are trying to estimate is 0.98. There are many different ways in which different combinations of weights gives you 0.98. That you pick one or the other is completely relevant for you. Okay. Any other question? Very well. So, oh, uh, it's just there's one yeah. more question. Uh, Miguel, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, with the past answer, my question has been solved because it's the idea of this change of view of framework. Of we are not interpreting the parameters as in classical econometrics. Exactly. You have thousands of them, but they are, in a sense, numerically equivalent to yep. those structural parameters we are normally interpreting. Yes, no, okay. So what you are doing is the following. What you are saying, what you are doing, and it will be a little bit clearer when I solve them, when I, I, I show you the model is I pick some parameter values. By par par parameter, I mean things that we have economic stories about them. The discount factor, the risk aversion. And then what I say is given this discount factor and this risk aversion, what are the weights that approximate the value function implied by that discount factor and that, uh, and that risk aversion? And what my claim is there are going to be many different combinations of weights that give you exactly the same value function. That's what the claim is. Thank you. Okay. And you don't care if it is one or the other. It's just, it works, it works. Okay. Anyway, so <coughs> let me tell you a little bit about optimization. And remember, the reason we are optimizing this thing is because we need to solve this arc mean. And the way we are going to do this arc mean minimization is with some form of descent direct iteration. And the descent direct iteration is very easy, is you have some initial point, theta one, okay? And you are going to find a direction of descent, dk. You are going to compute a step size, alpha, and the new candidate point is just going to be the theta sub k you super k you had before plus the step size times the direction. And that gives you the new point. And the choice of alpha and d is going to determine the flavor of the algorithm. In particular, a very natural choice for the direction is the gradient, which you know was already proposed by Cauchy in 1847. And basically what you want to do is that the direction is just minus the gradient. And you can normalize the gradient if you want. And now you see why computing the gradient over here with back propagation was so important. Because what we are going to do is we are going to pick some initial theta, which you know, can come over here. Okay. And, you know, the, the reason we were coming back to the question before, we are breaking symmetry just, you know, to be in a random point that is not, you know, it's a little bit random. Okay. So it's not, it doesn't have any kind of crazy situation. And then we just look at the gradient of the neural network and we move in the direction of the descent, okay? And the best way to think about this is for instance, you are over here, you look at the gradient, you move over there, then you look at the gradient, you move over there, you are at the gradient, you move over there, and you keep doing this until you get to the mean. And the reason this works very well is of course, because if you select the alpha in the right way, you can actually show that this converges. Now, how do you select the alpha in practice? Well, you can do it in a sophisticated way, or you can do it in a very simple way, which is you just fix some alpha and doing it at that step. And you know, this is an advice I heard when I was a graduate student, and I don't remember who told me that. So that's why I say heard 
in the Minnesota Econ Gravity Student Lab. If you don't know where you are going, at least go slowly, which means that these steps are going to be relatively small. And coming back to our web page, this is what in this web page they call as learning rate. And you can select very, very small learning rates or very aggressive learning rates. And you can see that by default, they give you something relatively small, but not too slow. Okay. And by the way, over here in this web page, you can also see that you can have the lasso regularization and the enrich regularization. Now, in practice, though, <clears throat> the problem with gradient descent is that even <coughs> if you have <coughs> back propagation that makes the evaluation of the gradient <coughs> excuse me <coughs> very easy you still need to evaluate this at many, many different points. You have all these Y L's and X L's. And if you have thousands and thousands of points, for instance, if you are simulating your model, that can be very costly. So what people do is they use something called a stochastic gradient descent. And a stochastic gradient descent is that instead of using all the data to evaluate the gradient, you only use one data point. So you randomly select one data point and you only use one data point to evaluate the gradient. Well, you evaluate an approximation to the gradient. That makes for a slower convergence rate, but for much faster computation. And also, because this is random, it helps you to get a stack in local minima. So for instance, this is what will happen with gradient descent when you are using all the observations, you will get a stack over here. But if you are doing it randomly, you will sometimes get over there, but maybe in the next iteration, you are actually getting something like this or something like that. Because remember, this is an approximation to the gradient and you will only stop where you really, really get to a global mean. And a stochastic gradient descent was really the insight that made training these neural networks with thousands of weights feasible around 2008, 2009. Also, as I mentioned over here, you don't really care about a global mean because optimization is not an end in, in itself. You are just trying to get a very good representation of the function. And as in my answer before, there are many possible weights that give you the same approximation or nearly the same approximation. And all of them have exactly the same implications for the behavior of the model. So even if you don't get the global mean, as long as you get something that is close enough to the global mean, that's good enough. Now, a stochastic gradient descent is very radical. You only use one data point. Something intermediate between a standard between a standard gradient descent and a stochastic gradient descent is to use something called the mini batch, and the mini batch, which is the most popular algorithm to train neural networks, what you do is instead of picking one point, you pick randomly one hundred. So it's not as radical as a stochastic gradient descent. You are still selecting randomly some of your data to evaluate the gradient, but you are not using all of them. So the evaluation of the gradient is still very fast. And again, going back to the web page by Google, the way you can see it over here is you see batch size, you can pick. So this will be a stochastic gradient descent pure. The batch size is one, or you can pick 10, or you can go all the way to 30, okay? And you will notice that playing with this batch size will also have an effect on the training of the network. So for instance, if I have a larger batch size, I will converge and the, the optimization will be faster, but sorry, I will converge at a faster rate, but the optimization is a little bit slower. While if I go to a much smaller batch size, 
things will take a little bit longer, but it will also be a little bit more robust. And you can see how it's jumping more as before. Okay, and that will also be, let me stop this. And that will also be part of the design of the architecture. Also, and this is a little bit more advanced, there is kind of a couple of refinements to um, gradient descent. And in particular these days, what people use a lot is the use of momentum. You don't need to worry too much about what it is. In my lecture notes, I have a lot of details about momentum, about why momentum work, but the best algorithm right now is called ADAM, okay? Which is adaptive moment estimation, and it's nothing more than a refinement of a stochastic gradient descent. The very good thing is if you are using one of the neural networks I was telling you before, sorry, one of the neural network libraries that I was telling you before, Adam will already be there. Okay, so you don't need to code it, you only need to understand what the algorithm does. So just to summarize, and then I stop for questions, how do you train your neural network? You minimize a quadratic error, perhaps with some L1 or L2 correction. And the way you do it is you are going to use a variation of gradient descent. And the variation of gradient descent that you want to use is probably Adam, which as I was mentioning before, is already coded in PyTorch or in JAX. Questions? Are there any questions right now? I don't see any in the chat, but if there are, feel free to jump in. Okay, very good. Well, so, oh, someone? No, nothing right now. Okay, very good. So finally, we can move into solving models. How in the world we are going to use all these things to solve a model in macrofinance? Well, <coughs> to do that, what you need to realize is that a very large class of problems in economics, what they are doing is they are looking for a function d that solves a functional equation. What I mean by a functional equation is that you are going to have an operator h and the function is going to make that operator equal to zero, which by the way, is the space zero, is the function zero, is not the scalar zero, okay? And this is the case both when you're solving for market equilibrium and when you're solving for social planner problems. So let me give you an example. And let's take the basic stochastic neoclassical growth model. So we have a social planner that is going to, and again, I'm going to do this for the social planner just because it's easy, but I could perfectly do this for the competitive equilibrium. It's going to maximize the expected discounted utility from consumption, given that we have a production function with some productivity ZT that evolves randomly over time and some depreciation of capital. And we can use our production and our capital for capital tomorrow or for consumption. And what we have is a first order condition that of course tells us that the marginal productivity utility today is equal to the marginal utility today, tomorrow, discounted, expected, and then some rate of return on capital. Okay? So this is the Euler equation we have all seen thousands of times. How can you think about this as a functional equation problem? Well, you can just take the right-hand side to the left, and the operator H is the manual utility today minus beta expected manual utility tomorrow. And now consumption is going to be D1 of the two states of the economy, capital and productivity. And D2 is going to be the decision for capital tomorrow that also depends on the state of the economy. So what we are looking for is for a policy function or decision rule, depending on how you like to call it, that when we put the first dimension of that decision rule over here and the first dimension over here and the second dimension over here, you get a zero in the Euler equation. Another way to think about this problem, for instance, could be to think about a value function. So this is solving a model using the Euler equations. Another possibility is to solve the model using a Bellman equation. 
And here, the function that you want to approximate is just the value function. The D is just going to be your value function. And then what I'm going to do is the operator is just the value function minus the Bellman equation. And if I get the right D, that is also a zero. So what I have tried to do is convince you that no matter what model you have in microfinance, this is a structural model, you are going to be able to either have some type of first order condition. I skip the case for conditional expectations, but you can have also the value function. At the end of the day, you are going to have some conditions that optimize the behavior of the agents and that sorts for the model, either the social planner or the competitive equity. And those conditions will depend on some functions, D. And those are the functions that are unknown. But now we go all the way back to our motivation of what machine learning was. And remember that what we were highlighting is that machine learning is about learning an unknown function. The unknown function we are going to be trying to be learning over here is going to be either the decision rule or the value function or whatever is convenient to solve in your model. Okay. And how is this going to work? Just a second to jump directly. The way we are going to do it is we are going to say exactly what we say before. Let me do it just with one layer. So it fits in one slide, but you know, if you had multiple layers, it will be the same. We are going to approximate either the value function or the decision rule or whatever other objects are interested as a neural network, where the X ends are just the states of the model. You are going to plug this into some loss function. You are going to minimize it using Adam or other related algorithm, and voila, you have solved your model. And because the value, sorry, the neural network breaks the course of dimensionality, you are going to be able to do this even if you are dealing, as I was saying before, with as many as 10,000 variables, state variables. Now, you need some data. Well, the data is going to be simulated parts of the economy, and we need to talk about how we simulate the economy if we haven't been able to solve it. We need a loss function. Remember, we were doing loss functions before. Well, the loss function is going to be the implied error in the equilibrium slash optimality conditions. So basically, what we are going to be looking is at how close this H, this operator H, is to zero. We are going to need a minimization algorithm. And of course, it's going to be some variation of a stochastic gradient descent. And that's what we are going to do it. And you know, in the next 40 minutes that I have left, I'm going to try to give you a flavor of some of applications of how you can do this thing, okay? But basically the idea is very simple. You are looking for some value function, some decision rule on the economy. <clears throat> you approximate those as neural networks and you train that neural network on simulated parts of the economy using a variation of a stochastic gradient descent. Now, if we had much more time, if we had a semester, I could go over code and I could beat this carefully. In the slides, for your convenience, I have put links to a lot of examples. So for instance, this will be an LQ uh, problem. This is Mahdi Kahu, who is one of my co-authors. Over here, you will have an example using the neoclassical growth model. Over here, this is from Simon Scheidegger, another of my co-authors. You will also have how to use this to solve overlapping generation models. And this is a favorite of mine, of course. This is my paper on financial frictions and the wealth distribution. Okay. So what I do is I invite you to take a look at all these codes and you can have time to look at them and try to figure it out exactly what is going on. I'm just going to go today and give you like a main outline of the ideas. But basically, again, it's always the same. You look at your model, your structural model, 
And the structural model is going to be characterized by some equilibrium or optimality conditions. And what you are going to do is solve for the value function or decision rules as a neural network that will give you a loss function and you minimize that loss function on simulated parts of the economy. Question about this big picture idea of how you use deep learning to solve models. Are there any questions right now? I don't see any in the chat. If anyone has a question, feel free to okay. ask. I hope that doesn't mean I have lost everyone, but anyway. <laughs> Let's get, for instance, in one example of dynamic programming. Let's try to think about the following case. We want to solve a Bellman equation where V is the value function, X is the state, and then we have some return function that depends on the state and the choice. Alpha is going to be our controls. And then of course we have a continuation that depends on our states tomorrow. And the states tomorrow are going to be a function, perhaps a stochastic between our states today and our control or choices. And we are going to have some constraints that can come in inequality and constraints that can come as equalities, okay? Notice that this framework is very general. Usually we will not have all these constraints, okay? Usually we will be able perhaps to substitute this H already over here in the loss of motion for the states, or sometimes we will not have inequality. Now, I really want to highlight this. I'm going to be thinking about cases where we have many state variables, okay? If X is one dimensional, well, then use value function iteration, which we have been using in my case for 30 years, and it's perfectly fine, okay? What I want to be thinking is you have many, many state variables. How far can you go with value function iteration with Chebyshev polynomials? You can go maybe to five state variables. You know, in some papers I have been able to do seven, but I'm not thinking about problems with five or seven state variables. I'm thinking about problems, as I was saying before, with 1,000 state variables, okay? Things where, you know, value function iteration is not even a contender. And that's really what I want to think about. I want to solve a value function that has many, many state variables. I'm going to do everything in discrete time in the presentation, but you can have exactly the same in continuous time with the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman instead of having a, a, a Bellman equation. Okay, so there is nothing really about deep learning and continuous time. Um, I say that because some of my early papers try to illustrate the advantage of deep learning using continuous time models. And a lot of people got the wrong idea that somehow deep learning requires the use of continuous time. It does not. It was just a random choice for that paper. Okay, you can perfectly do uh, deep learning in discrete time or you can do it in continuous time. It doesn't matter whatsoever. It's just whatever you decide to do. Okay, <clears throat> so how do you solve this problem? Well, you have a value function and you are going to define a neural network that approximates that value function. You are also going to have a decision rule and you are going to approximate the policy function alpha also with a neural network. Why do you want to approximate both the value function and the decision rule? Well, in principle, you could get away with defining only one of the two because the value function implies a policy function and the policy function implies a value function. In practice, numerically, it's better to try to approximate both of them at the same time, okay? But this is just purely for practical considerations. And in the case that you have inequality and equality constraints, you are going to have also a neural network <laughs> that is going to approximate the Karush contactor multipliers, mu and lambda of the inequality and equality constraints, okay? So what you are going to do is have as many as four neural networks, although you can always think about it just as one very large neural network with multiple outputs. Very good. So what is the error? Yes. There was one question whether you mentioned value function iteration, like how yeah. it compares in terms of precision. Uh, so the question is, does neural network solve the problem like 
with value function duration precision? Is it a global okay. method? Yeah, or yeah, okay. So this is, this is an important point. A neural network can approximate any Borel measurable function to any desired degree of accuracy. Okay? So if I have enough layers and I have enough M's, enough nodes, I can get as much accuracy as I want. I can go to computer zero. So computer zero is usually 16 decimals because we are probably using a 64 bit machine. I can get to computer zero. Thomas is asking very related. He has a setting where he says he's unable to get the error down. Um, Thomas, do you want to ask your question? See if we can relate it to the discussion. No, you basically you basically uh, answered. You have to add more layers and more neurons, yeah. and you can exactly. go. That's, and that's, that's the point about the design of the architecture. You need to. This will be in the design of the architecture. How good is your your design? Okay. Now. Also, if this is a very, very complicated, remember, I'm telling you the very basic uh, architecture. If you have an extremely complex problem, you may want to explore some of the slightly more advanced architectures I'm skipping today. Okay. So you, you. Need to, you need to define errors. So you are going to have a Bellman error, which is just the right hand of the Bellman equation minus the left hand where instead of evaluating at the exact but unknown decision rules and value functions, we approximate it with a neural network. And we are going to have an error in the policy function. And I know this sounds very complicated, but this is just the Euler equation, okay? This is just a general notation for the Euler equation. So again, basically what you are looking is, is how different is the left-hand side of the Euler equation from the right-hand side of the Euler equation. And you are also going to have the associated errors for the equality and the inequality. And then you just sum them. Now, you can have some weights in the sum. I play with the thing, at least in the examples I play with, I didn't feel fine that having weights in the errors make much of a difference, but in your particular case, it may be the case. It may be the situation, okay? So just to summarize what we are doing, is basically what we are saying is, look, I have this Bellman equation. Let me have one neural network to approximate the value, another neural network to approximate the decision rule, a neural network to approximate the uh, multiplier over there, another neural network to approximate the multiplier over there. And then the error is either the Bellman equation error or the Euler equation error or the constraints errors. And I just sum all of them. Okay, very good. And now I need to train it. So how do I train this? Well, let me say it in words and then we can go back to the slides. I basically come up with some initial weights for the network, okay? So remember, we have all these weights in theta and I come up with some initial weights. How do I do it? Well. <laughs> I suggested before to sample from a normal distribution, okay? If you have some knowledge about how the, uh, the shape of the value function or the decision rule look like, maybe you have an approximated solution using a perturbation, you can use those to come up with some initial weights. Given some initial weights, well, you have a value function and you have a decision rule. So you can simulate data, okay? If I give you, if I go back to my model over here and I tell you I have an approximation for alpha for the decision rule, I just apply it and that will give me X primes. That X primes, I will feed it recursively. So that will give me a whole sequence of X and that will give me a V. So I just simulate my model given the initial weights. And now that I have simulated my model given the initial weights, what I can say is, given the evolution of the x's, can I retrain my network? That is, can I fit what I have simulated better than before to get a better decision rule? If I know that capital today was 32 and tomorrow was 35 and the next day was 48, 
Could I have done better in terms of my consumption decision? Could I have done better in terms of my value function? And I keep doing this until I train the network and I train, I retrain the network. Once I have trained the network, I simulate the data again. And each of these steps is called an epoch. And then I retrain my network. And I keep doing this until convergence. And the key over here, of course, is that someone was asking, do you have enough simulations? Yes, I can have as many as I want. That's the good thing about simulating. If I want to have 10 billion observations, I can simulate 10 billion observations. Second very good thing about this is all these simulations are extremely easy to parallelize, which means that this can be run very, very fast. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Gabriel, do you want to ask your question? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Sure, I do. So, so in the in some of the construction of the errors, we still have the expectation over the future, the value function in the future. So, yeah, sometimes, I mean, I guess it's. Do you have any thoughts about how to deal with these expectations? How to take expectations here in the discrete time case? <laughs> Use continuous time. But <laughs> sure, sure. Thank you. No, but that was precisely why my first papers were always in continuous time because I was trying to argue. Look. Neural networks are not going to fix the problem of the expectation. Okay, so I have another paper. Let me go back at the very beginning. Over here, if you go to lecture, lecture eight, symmetry in dynamic programming, I try to talk about how to use concentration of measure to evaluate those expectations in a relatively efficient way. Okay, It's a little bit more advanced of what can I cover today, but take a look at lecture eight. Do you hear it? Yes, thank you, thank you. Okay. But yes, solving that expectation is a problem. And in fact, there is a couple of papers out there that try to use neural networks to solve some models, and I don't think they do the approximation of the expectation right. Okay. Very good. <clears throat> <clears throat> so let me show you how this will work in practice. And I'm going to use the neoclassical growth model and precisely to get around the problem of the expectation that Gabriel was raising, I'm going to do it in continuous time. But the only reason I'm doing it in continuous time, again, is for, the, for not having an expectation today and not having to discuss how I solve the expectation, which in some sense is something that does not really depend on neural networks. It's something completely different than orthogonal. So we are going to have a neoclassical growth model in continuous time. And then the hamilton jacobi bellman is you have the value function, the discount rate, and then what you have is the derivative of the value function, the production function, minus depreciation, minus consumption. Okay? The very good thing about this case is that I know what the decision rule is. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve the model first using the fact that I know what the decision rule is. And later on, I will solve the model without taking advantage that I know what the decision rule is. So you have a feeling of both cases. The parametrization for this, the calibration is going to be absolutely standard. Okay, so what do I do? Well, in the neoclassical growth model, in some sense, what I have already been able to do is to plug in this H over there in the function f, and I don't have any inequality constraint. So I get rid of both multipliers. Okay, that's what I have substituted in the inequality, the, the quality constraint. And since I'm going to take advantage that I know what the decision rule is, the only error that I have is the Bellman equation. Well, in this case, the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation. So I take my value function the network that I'm using, and I say, hey, this is my network minus the utility function, the inverse of the uh, manual utility, the derivative of my value function, which by the way, is straightforward to compute because the neural network has a very simple structure, which if you are using ReLUS, gives you a straightforward derivatives to compute, minus the derivative again over here, and this law of motion. 
I'm going to do it in a very simple way. I'm going to have three layers. I'm going to have eight neurons. Today, you know, for some historical accident that is irrelevant for today, uh, when I first did this exercise, I did it with hyperbolic tangents. That doesn't really matter. And this is my Gaussian initialization. As I was saying before, I just get from zero for this square root. And this is what I get. So in orange, I solve the model using finite differences. Finite differences are kind of very similar to value function iteration, except that you are doing it in continuous time. And I'm going to use a finite different difference that has a lot of points, which basically means I'm getting to computer zero in terms of the Euler equation error. And on blue, you see the neural network approximation. Well, you don't really see it. And the reason you don't really see it is because the point I'm trying to make over here is that the neural network approximation does exactly as well as the final difference. Now, some of you will be saying, but why in the world you want to use neural network to approximate this very, very simple problem that you can solve with finite differences. Of course, in real life, I will never do this. This is just for teaching. Okay? This is just to convince you that neural networks work. But if I had a more sophisticated value function problem with 10 state variables, I don't know if anyone has ever tried to do finite differences with more than two state variables. It's just a nightmare. Don't, don't even try to do it. However, with a neural network approximation, I can go to three, four, five, 10 dimensions without any problem whatsoever. I can show you also the consumption that I get from my neural network approximation and with finite difference. So basically that will be my decision rule over there. And again, I get that they are absolutely on top of each other. And I can show you how the error works along the number of iterations. So at the beginning, the error is relatively high, but then it starts doing much better. And this is in, lo in logs, but by the time I get over here, this error is so small that I get this perfect approximation. Okay? And you know, if you look at the code, you will realize that the code is very straightforward, doesn't really have anything very deep on it, and that it takes advantages. Some of the code is over here, okay? And it takes advantage of the libraries that we have around. I can do the same where now I approximate as well the policy function. This is a situation where I just don't know what the shape of the policy function is for whatever the reason. And now, in addition to the Bellman equation error, I also have a policy function error, and it's still the case. I get the value function perfectly fine. I get the decision rule perfectly fine. Well, you know, see a little bit of a difference over there, but it's really very really small. And this is the number of iterations. Okay. So what I'm basically have tried to convince you is that by following this approach, you can solve dynamic programming problems in extremely high dimensions in a very efficient way. Okay. Questions? No questions in the chat right now, anyone? Oh, one just showed up. Are values of the value function as inputs when training? I'm sure I understand the question. Okay. <clears throat> yes, but they are the values of the value function that comes from the simulation that you have done before. Okay, so the point is you get some weights. With those weights, you have a value function. And with that value function, you make decisions. And then you retrain the network for the value function given the decisions you have made. You are basically trying to say, given the decisions I have made, could I have done better? And that will give me a new value function. Okay. So the value function, given the weights at that moment, remember, we are, you are updating the weights all the time. The weights that you are using in that particular step is what giving you the optimal choices of X, of alpha that is giving you the evolution of the excess. 
Take a look at the code. In the code, it's very clear what is happening. Okay. Um, another question that just came in. Steven, do you want to ask your question? It's about regime shift, models with regime shifts. Uh, oh, thank you so much for the talk. I really learned a lot. Just curious. So uh, how does neural network deal with regime shifts? Let's say a COVID hits. Um, you know, th these are exogenous events. How will the neural network deal with that? Thank you so much. Okay. So look, this is, this is not a problem for the, uh, for the neural network. This is about how you deal with the model. Okay. So in the model, you will need to incorporate, this is a problem of specification of the model. In the model, you will need to incorporate the idea that these random processes have something like the arrival of COVID. But this is not a problem for the neural network. The neural network is solving a model. What you're asking me is a question of how you write a model that has COVID. That's not what we are doing today. Okay? There are many models that incorporate the idea of COVID, but the, the neural network is to solve. Okay, I want to be this very clear. What the neural network is doing is solving the model. It's not inventing the model. Okay, So you need to write your model and then the neural network is going to solve the model. That's what we are doing today. Any other question? Yeah, we have a couple more. Um, why, when you were showing over the iterations, the error was declining, but it got kind of erratic towards yeah. the end, jumping up and down? Why has that happened? Well, remember that everything is a simulation. So what happens is as you're doing simulations, sometimes you, know, and you don't go in the right direction. You go, you are picking a new, and you are using a stochastic gradient descent. So it's not only simulation, but the optimization is also random, which means that sometimes you move in the opposite direction, okay? In fact, that's why the algorithm converges. You want, I will actually argue that the fact that this thing is not monotone is a, is a feature, it's a, it's a great thing, is what avoids you getting stuck in local mean. Now, also note that these are locks. So even if this looks like a lot of fluctuation, it's actually a very small one. If I do this in levels, you will realize it's very, very small. Okay, but the thing this convergence is not monotone. <laughs> the errors are not monotone. It's because we are doing everything on simulation in terms of simulating the data, and because we, we are optimizing in a simulated way, we are using a stochastic gradient descent. Okay, that's what you want. By the way, you always want these things to be non-monotone. If you don't have fluctuations, it means you are doing something that is not right. By the way, let's go to our web page from our friends from Google. Let's see what I was. Okay, and the error is over here. So let's restart this from the beginning. Let me put about size of 10, so that's okay. Okay, we click, you see, this is the, this is the error at the beginning, it's kind of monotone and then it starts fluctuating. You see over here, that's exactly the same because we are doing everything is random. It's a, it's a random sampling from the, from the, from the from the thing, okay. Couple more questions. Sure. Um, if there's a relatively few dimensions like this, like five state variables, does the neural network then is it faster than finite differences? So in cases where you can use both, is one faster? <laughs> if you can, if you can quote a five dimensional finite difference, uh, please give me a call. <laughs> You are not going to be able to quote a five-dimensional finite differences. <laughs> Look, finite differences, you can do three dimensions at most. You cannot do, you just cannot do five. It just doesn't happen. Okay, last question is a little more. <laughs> Sorry. Provocative, I guess. It's asking, if, if what's the catch? If neural network methodology is so good, why isn't it used more widely in dynamic prop programming? Okay. Um, okay, so first of all, two, two answers. If you are doing this, as I was mentioning before, for one to two dimensions, value function iteration is faster. Okay, so I will never solve the neoclassical growth model with neural networks. I will always use value function iteration or finite differences, it's so much faster. Again, we are talking about problems with five or more state variables. Why is not more use? to begin with, because there are very few models in economics that have five state variables or more. People just didn't know how to use them. 
Okay, so pick your average issue of the American Economic Review or Econometrica or the Journal of Political Economy and tell me how many models you see with more than five state variables. You see a few here and there, but usually they take like tons of times and you know six months to compute. I have a relatively famous paper solving uh, nonlinear no adventures at the zero lower bound, and we have five state variables, and it took us six months to code that thing. Okay, uh, using Chelice for polynomials. Now, of course, I will always do that paper using neural networks. Why we haven't been doing this more in the past? Well, because a lot of the things I told you today, we just didn't know five years ago. We didn't have a good understanding of the geometric aspects of neural networks. And we didn't have a lot of the theoretical results that we need to employ. And furthermore, we didn't have the libraries. And that's what really makes a difference. Okay, I cannot emphasize this enough. What makes this feasible is that I can call PyTorch and code everything in PyTorch. Okay, let's go and look at some of the codes. And again, I'm not going to go over the code in detail, but if you look at this code, for instance, this linear quadratic problem by Mahdi, what you will realize is that what really makes difference over here so let me see where he is loading the, the relevant aspects to it. Okay, here is where he is going to solve the problem using a deep, deep neural network is that he's loading PyTorch over here. Okay, and the code to solve the problem is going to be extremely simple. Okay, it's going to be just this thing. But of course, the reason why this is so fast and so efficient to code is because the optimizer over here and all the definition of the neural network, you see, we use Adam, is because we are going to use the Adam that is already in PyTorch. And we are going to define the neural network. I'm not quite sure what the neural network is, but that's okay. And we are going to define, oh, over here, this is where we define the neural network. Okay. is the fact that we are going to, you just say four layers, 120, 128 nodes per layer, is that you can do this in five lines. If you were trying to do this without PyTorch, it will be tons of lines of code and it will be very difficult to do in the past. Okay. It's really, as I was saying before, the combination of the fact that we have these libraries that computers are very fast and that we can uh, understand the theoretical reasons why these neural networks work. Okay? And that's why this has completely revolutionized science. I mean, if you go to fields in applied math, everything is being rewritten right now with deep neural networks just because it's so much more efficient than what we were doing before. Okay? So these things are really, this is a really a game changer. Any other question? No more right now. Okay, so I have only 10 minutes left. So let me give you also a flavor of how this can be applied to models with uh, heterogeneous agents. And basically what happens in models with heterogeneous agents is that we need to keep track of the distribution of agents, G, and the operator that tells you how that distribution of agents evolves over time. So for instance, just to do these things in discrete time, we have that the distribution of agents is GT today. We have some other aggregated state variables and that gives you a new distribution of agents. And the problem is how do we keep track of GT and how do we compute H, the operator? Okay. Well, a common approach that uh, this works is if you are dealing with n discrete types, that's very straightforward. We only keep track of n minus one weights in the distribution. But if we are dealing with continuous types, what we do is we extract a finite number of features from GT. So for instance, we can extract some moments or we can extract quantiles or we can express the distribution as a mixture of normals, 
which we know we can approximate in a distribution well, in a very large class as a mixture of normals, and we just keep the weights in that mixture of normals. Okay, and then what we do is we stack either the weights when we have discrete types or the features of the distribution in a vector mu t. And what we do is we assume that the operator h g s t is substituted by the operator h mu t or s t. This is where the trick is, okay? We have this operator that we don't know how to approximate because this gt, if for instance is continuous, is an infinite dimensional <coughs> object into this operator that depends on mu t. And then what we are going to do is we are going to approximate mu, sorry, h, given some parametrization. And as you can imagine, the way we are going to do this is with a neural network. And why is a neural network going to be so efficient? Because mu in general is going to be a very highly dimensional object. So the neural network can approximate it. Let me give you an example that all of you, or many of you probably know, which is the basic Crusella Smith model. In the basic Crusella Smith model, what Crusella and Smith say is instead of keeping track of the distribution of assets of the households, what we do is we keep track of the mean, well, of the log of the mean. And then we parameterize the law of motion for the log of the mean as this linear function where these coefficients depend on the aggregate state variables. And basically what Crusella and Smith do is they say, well, we are going to determine these coefficients by ordinary least squares on a simulation. I come up with some theta zeros and theta one, I simulate the model, and then given the simulation, I run a noiseless. Well, after everything I have told you, this should already sound very familiar because what we are doing with the neural network is absolutely the same. In fact, what Crusell and Smith do is a very simple, it's a very, very simple neural network. They basically say, I take the mean, the log of the mean of the distribution. Let's go to the previous slide. I substitute capital H for lowercase h, and I parameterize h as this linear regression. And then I run OLS. And OLS, by the way, is just a way to minimize a quadratic error. And by simulation, it's just another way to do direct descent method. What I'm going to tell you is that you can generalize the ideas of Crusell and Smith with neural networks. Why? Because first of all, neural networks is going to tell you mu can incorporate any feature of the distribution you find of interest. For instance, you can take all the quantiles you want. So you can approximate as finely grained as you want in your distribution. And then instead of having to parameterize as a linear function, you just have a deep neural network to parameterize in a generalized way. And then instead of doing OLS, you do a stochastic gradient descent, but the ideas are exactly the same. Okay, and that's exactly what you do. And that's how you use neural networks to solve a very, very large class of models with heterogeneous agents. You take the distribution, you find some features of the distribution that gives you a function H, an operator H, and you approximate in that operator H with a neural network. And if you want an example of how we do this, this is with my paper, the financial frictions and the wealth distribution. And by the way, all the material in that paper, all the code is over here in this repo that I mentioned before. Okay, I only have a couple of minutes and I want to leave a couple of minutes for questions, but the punchline over there in the paper is that we are going to have a distribution of agents in the economy. Let me jump directly to where we do it. 
okay? And that distribution, we approximate the evolution using a neural network. And we actually argue and document that that neural network, and you know, we minimize the neural network exactly in the same way that we were saying before. And what we argue over there is that first of all, the neural network gets a much better solution that Crusell Smith gets a much better solution than any type of Chebyshev approximation. And also, since someone asked before about uh, extrapolation, extrapolates much better. This is the ergodic distribution. And that's where we train the neural network. It approximates, extrapolates outside the ergodic distribution in a very natural way. Okay. And the reason why, in addition to it, this is really very interesting is because by being able to capture the whole nonlinear dynamics of the model, we are able to uncover a lot of interesting nonlinear dynamics, which, you know, if I had a little bit more time, I could go in detail over it. But in particular, this is a model that despite having a unique rational expectations equilibrium, however, has two stochastic steady states and the economy fluctuates between these different stochastic steady states given a very rich set of behavior. And that's the type of models you can compute with neural networks, but that will be extremely difficult to compute with traditional methods that cannot really handle high dimensional or very highly nonlinear methods. Okay, so it's 11.57. Um, should we have like a, a couple of minutes for a final round of questions? Let's see, are there any Questions that people have right now? There's nothing in the chat. Oh, here we go. Uh, Matthias, do you want to ask your question live? Feel free to unmute. All right. Okay. So let me ask it for you then. Matthias is asking Do I understand correctly that in that paper, you only approximate the distribution with the neural network, but not the household value functions as in your example cases? Yes, and the reason we all we approximate the value function using finite differences is because the <clears throat> value function problem of the household is sufficiently easy that we can solve it with finite differences. And what we wanted to do was to show that it was really approximating the operator of the distribution that made the difference. We didn't want the reader to say, oh, is because you're approximating the value function of the household this way, or is because you're approximating the operator? So we just wanted to say, no, 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 no. This is just the operator, okay? Of course, we could approximate the value function of the household also with the neural network. It will give you exactly the same answer. In fact, I said before, I said over here in this slide, okay? But we just wanted, you do all this time when you are writing models, you always want to change only in a direction so the reader and the referees can really appreciate what the contribution of what you are doing is, okay? So it's not that we didn't want to do it, it's just that we thought in that way, everything will be much more transparent. Thomas, you have a related question real quick? We only have one minute. Yep. Um, so two things, uh, here you're, you're um, approximating the operator of the column going forward. Um, mm -hmm. Did you see any occurrence where you approximating the distribution itself instead of using the empirical uh, distribution, you're using a, a neural net to approximate the measure? I know it could be could be tricky yeah. because of like, the zero and stuff. That's the first question. And the second question is like, did you see any people in doing a deep Galerkin method? So it's kind of related, right? Because you would yeah. use the um, uh, in economics. I know in math people do, but... Uh, yeah. So maybe you have, yeah. the you have second, seen something yeah. different. Yeah. So for the second question, no, it's actually a very interesting idea that will be nice to, to experiment. For the first one, I put one of my research assistants to try to do it and he didn't come up with a very clean answer. Uh, it's one of the things I want to do this for, to see if I can get the, the neural network to approximate the distribution directly. And the reason I want to do it is because I want to think about the neural network as extracting the features of the distribution itself efficiently. I sent emails to a bunch of people in, um, in math. None of them have seen that problem, but since you ask, let me show you this. Uh, let me show you this. Uh, I hope you can see distributional. There is this whole new area called distributional reinforcement learning. And I think that over there, that's exactly what they are trying to think about, how to approximate the distributions themselves. 
Can you see yes. the, the, the web page? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you. This guy, Mark Bellemer. I mean, Will and Mark can also be very, the other Mark can be very smart, but I know Bellemer is really, really sharp guy. Uh, Miguel is asking if there's any other course reference this in addition to the lecture. Okay. So if you go to my web page and you go to teaching and you go to machine learning. So in my slides, I really try to get out of my way to have as many references as possible. Okay. And so for instance, these are the two basic books, Probabilistic Machine Learning and Probabilistic Machine Learning Advanced Topics by Kevin Murphy. Both books are fantastic. And moreover, they are online. Probabilistic Machine Learning. Yeah. So this is the second one and the other one is also online. Both of them, both of them are online. Those are absolutely the top sources of information that you want to. If you know those two books well, believe me, you can get a job at, at Google <laughs> or, or a top research department in any, any, any moment. Now, I also like a lot, this one is super cool. So if you go to YouTube and put machine learning, a street talk, every kind of month or so, they interview some of the very top people in the field, okay? And the interviews are amazing. And, you know, this is a little bit nerdy, so they can really you know, get really into it. But if I go, for instance, this is one of my favorite videos. Now, Mishi, so you're talking about- Okay, this is the episode 60, it's called Geometric Deep Learning. And is where, this is the guy, he's at Imperial College in London. And he is the person who kind of really um, make the uh, geometric interpretation <laughs> develop the geometric interpretation of deep learning. So this is quite, so it's just in YouTube. So if you put in YouTube and you will have over here, like some of the very, very top people in the field, like Jan Lecun, Joshua Bengio. Uh, this is the paper, I was, the, the video I was telling you about geometric, uh, Francois Cholet. Now, if you also go to, uh, let me go back to where I was. Sorry, I think I have, I have lost my own slides. No. Let me keep going over again. If you go to coding machine learning, second set of slides. This over here, there will be a GitHub repo for uh, Aurelien Guerron, and he has a lot of courses that are more than anything more than the very, very deep learning stuff is about how to use the libraries, okay? So that's what I mean. You can see over here, for instance, TensorFlow, et cetera. That will be a very good uh, references. And also over there, I have uh, some references. For instance, this book, Deep Learning with Python by Francois Cholet is really fantastic textbook. I have another few more references over there. And then, Sorry, if I'm taking a couple more minutes, but I think this can be useful in introduction to deep learning. This book by Ian Gottfellow and his co-author is fantastic. It's the best book on deep learning. <laughs> the only problem is that it's four years old and this is really a field that is moving at an extreme fast speed. So even four years is making it a little bit uh, outdated along some aspects. This one by Charu Agarwal, who is the chief researcher on deep learning at IBM is also very, very nice, okay? But in general, the point is, if you go over my, my, my lecture notes, I try to, oh, and in reinforcement learning, this is the Bible of reinforcement learning by Richard Sutton and Andrew Barto. And I also have references over there to a lot of codes over there. I try to keep, by the way, I try to keep my slides updated. So you will see that if you go, you know, every month or every couple of months, I try to update with the most recent things. But I will say, go to my slides, take a good look at them, and probably over there will have all the references that you need. Jesus, this is amazing. Thank you so much. I think everyone really enjoyed it. It was super useful. I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. We'll see you back tomorrow for day two of the Macrofinance Virtual Summer School. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.